But just to start off, what are we doing and why are we here? For me, the most important thing of why we've set these breakfasts up, and we've got the privilege of having a lot of people in the room that have been over to America with us. We, we, we see what's happening on the ground there, but we also have a lot of fun together, and, and it's quite nice to get together as a group of people. So for me, the first thing is about networking. It's just about catching up and you know, finding out what's happening, what's your experience. Because can we all agree that property realistically goes, well, good and bad? Yeah? yeah. And it's not all perfect. And if anyone thinks that it's 100% perfect, you're probably in the wrong room. Because you probably haven't bought property before, and I don't think we should be helping you then. Um, so, so for me, the purpose of this type of event is to also sit down and say, look, you know, I might have this challenge, or this is what, uh, this is, what is, uh, is not working for me. So we've actually got a form, and you'll find it in the pack, called a Challenges Form. And our idea behind it is that if anyone has a problem, because things are changing dynamically all the time, whether it's the banks or, or, or whether it's rentals or management or communication or anything, we like to know about it, and then our commitment is we'll, we'll get it back. We, we're growing the team, and I'll go through that in a little bit more, but then they can get back within 48 hours and, and help you get it sorted. So we can't make all the problems go away, but we do, we do like to. So again, the, the, the forum of this breakfast is to be able to hear what's going on. If there are things that we're not aware of, we can help fix them. The other thing that I think is very important is that the market changes so dynamically and so quickly. For those of you guys that were there in February with us, you know, when I was back in May, you would think we were in a different country again. It is incredible how quickly things are changing in, the, in America. I will give the Americans one thing. They go down hell of a hard, but they come up as quickly, you know, in, in terms of what's happening. So for me, it's a case of saying, you know, doesn't when you were there in October, and that's another world now. Like really, like what was an opportunity in October to now, it's, it's a different place. Some people, someone said they were here, God, you mentioned that uh, there's possibly an opportunity a, a year ago. Was anyone at the breakfast that Brendan and I did a year ago in May last year? No. Okay. We've lost all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I think, I think the, the important thing is a year ago to now, I mean, things are changing. So the whole purpose here is that Brendan and I go over every three months, as you know. And so whether you bought yourself already, whether you were even there, some Antonian was with us, uh, you know, four weeks ago. We will constantly keep you updated as to what's happening on the ground in terms of the market, what's happening with the opportunities, which I think is invaluable as an investor in terms of where we're at. The, uh, the other thing is, is in terms of keeping you up to date with the opportunities. So whether you've invested already, like some people that have in this room, or whether you haven't, the most important thing is to actually get set up. Get yourself a, a structure, an LLC, get yourself a bank account, start to build your credit rating. Our objective today would be that if nothing else, everyone has that mindset and starts to get set up. Does that make sense? Whether you buy a property or not, it doesn't matter. You need to get the right structure set up, you need to get your bank account set up, so that that is all in order at a later stage when you, when you want it. I always say to people, what's the worst case? If you've got an American bank account, you can buy stuff on iTunes. <laughs> and then lastly, for us, you know, we, 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 we're constantly scouring the market. We've got, you know, we've got great partners on the ground in terms of finding opportunities. So one of the things that we want to do is help people actually build global portfolios. And, and by sitting at these type of events, we can sit with people, we can understand where they're at. If they've already invested, we can understand what's going right, what's going wrong. We can, we can look at the market, what has changed. We can help them adapt and build it. We're not in the game. I personally have no interest in helping people buy one-off properties. Because I don't do that, so it's hard to, I can't advise someone on something that I don't know how to do. For me, it's about building portfolios. And by doing that, we can, but whether you've got one property or whether you've got no properties, doesn't matter, because if you've got no properties, we've got to get you started on the process. Does that make sense? So that's, that's our whole objective. And one of the things that we're putting together, and Brendan's actually building a, 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 a system behind it, is where we're wanting to bring some sort of program and we've, we've toyed with the name, the Peace of Mind program, etc. But the whole idea behind it, and I'm sure um, there's people in this room that would attest to that, that buying a property, you know, John Chen mentioned it at the extravaganza. Can I see a show of hands? Who was at the extravaganza? Just so that I know. Okay. Um, John Chen was out here, and he said, you know, buying a property is one third about buying the property, one third about management and maintenance, and one third about all the other stuff, the tax, the structuring, the ongoing tax, the ongoing management, etc. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there are people in this country running around selling you just a property in America. 
And, and please, you need to understand that the property is just one third of the whole aspect in terms of what's happening. So the whole purpose behind the, the Peace of Mind program is to provide the longevity in terms of the service, to remind you that you need to have your tax return in by the end of April, because if you don't, it's like $400 a month or something. What yeah, per, per individual, it's about 400 Per individual, per month or something. Yeah. It's a ridiculous number. Okay, funny guys, I don't know. So that's the whole idea in terms of you know, giving people that peace of mind. Because I understand you're all busy, I understand you all, you're all successful, I understand you've all got a lot on your plate. And so what we want to do is, through our experience of through Brendan's ability to build systems, make it easy for you so that it's easy to track in terms of where you're at. So those are our objectives in terms of this breakfast. There is one gentleman to thank, and um, some people in the room will recognize his name, Michael. You guys will, will know Michael. Michael's been on my case quite a lot. He came with us in February on the buyer's trip in, uh, in, when we went out in February. And he personally asked a number of times for us to do these type of breakfasts. He said to me, listen, you know, so it's very important because I like to, uh, he's, he's, he's in Durban, he's networked with a couple of the guys in Durban. He said, listen, I own properties there. I not only want to meet with the other people who are on the buyer's trip, but I want to meet with other investors. And to be honest, it's got nothing to do with whether you invested through IPS or not. It's irrelevant. We are all American investors, and therefore we all got a common goal, common objective, common, common uh, basis. Does that make sense? In terms of where we're at. Yep. So that's, uh, that's really the basis of, of where we came for. And I think, I think the, the slogan behind it is most important. It's power to USA investors by USA investors in terms of what we're looking at. There's two real objectives, and for me, the whole thing behind Wildfire Act that Brendan and I and Henny built was this whole using nature's laws. So a bird, you, a lot of you would have seen this slide before, but a flock of birds, 25 birds, can fly 70% further than doing it on your own. So at the end of the day, don't get me wrong, you can jump on an airplane tomorrow morning, you can fly to Atlanta, you can fly to New York, you can fly to London, you can fly to Sydney, you can go buy property. But I can pretty much guarantee you, based on nature's laws, you'll be more successful if you work with other people, and, and you, you work with people that will be doing it, and we work together as a team. And the philosophy of RPS, was, um, and the company's been going 10 years in September, two, it's in September this year, it's September 2003, that we actually started. And the whole principle was Zig Ziglar. You can have anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. So we're investors, we're investing, and other people started asking Brendan and I, how are you doing and what are you doing? And, and we started helping other people invest with us in terms of what we're doing. So for me, I don't want to dwell too long on this, but people always say to me, Scott, why do you invest overseas? Why did you live in London for nine years? And the, the honest answer is that I'm half Zimbabwean and I'm half South African. So my mother's side of the family is, is South African, four generations, and my father's side is uh, Zimbabwean, three generations. And I absolutely love Africa. I'm completely passionate about it. I'm not going to sit here and bad mouth it. It's got nothing to do with that. However, I am realistic in terms of my own expectations of what I want for me and my family. So for me, there's five things that are very important in terms of why I personally invest overseas. The first one is the root of law. The second one is political and economic instability. The third one is wealth preservation. The fourth one is, unfortunately, when people try and get their money out, they actually lose money. And the fifth one is currency devaluation. And just to remind you quickly, the most important thing for me with rule of law, I bought my last investment property in South Africa in 2010. The reason being is that in 2010, the cops came to arrest me because my tenant hadn't paid. Now my tenant hadn't paid for four months. I decided that I would help them out because they obviously had a security problem and I put a security gate on their door to, to make sure that they uh, you know, had no further security to get my rent paid. And unfortunately in the process, I was deemed to be the criminal who was now locking them out of their own house and got arrested by the police. Now at that same time, it just happened to be that the lady worked for FNB Home Loans F&B home loans, and I happened to have my loan with F&B, and when I went to see F&B, they couldn't care less. One of their employees from F&B home loans hadn't paid me for four months. And I just realized at the time, this is ridiculous. I, as the property owner, am the criminal. Whereas, believe it or not, and I'm sure Tony will attest this, in a first world country, it's the most amazing phenomenon. The rights of property ownership are protected. I know it sounds like a foreign concept. <laughs> it is a foreign concept. <laughs> the second thing for me is political and economic instability, and I think it's summed up best by this gentleman. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How is the morning? How is the sun? President Jacob Zuma knows all too well that the performance of the economy is no laughing matter. With strike season looming large, he has urged business and unions to avoid drawn out battles. Even the beginning of the collective bargaining season in both mining and other industries is called on parties to recognize the impact of the industrial relations environment on jobs and development. <laughs> Desperate to avoid a repeat of last year's tragic event in Marigana, Zuma has mandated his deputy, Kalema Mutante, to lead talks in the mining sector. He's meeting, for an example, NUM, he's also meeting AMCO, uh, as well as NACTU, where AMCO is now affiliated, as well as Kosatu. So we are not meeting others and not others. I don't think the government has taken any stand that takes some. South Africa's growth rate has fallen below 2%, pushing the rand to a four-year low against the US dollar. And Zuma has appealed to the media to go easy on the country. Ladies and gentlemen, just report nicely. Okay, about South Africa. <laughs> Thank you very much. And all in now. Pretoria. News. The news. ENCA.com. So my, my objective here is not to be negative at all. I'm just being pragmatic. So, on your USB, you should all... All of you have been given a USB? You should all have a USB. Uh, for those of you who had the extravaganza, if you want to return your other one, it's fine, no, I'm joking. <laughs> but it's got all the updated information, and most importantly, it's got all these articles, okay, that I'm about to show you. So, in the, in the interest of saving trees, we haven't printed them for everyone, but they're all on your USB. And for me, I'm just going to run through some articles today, because this is the whole purpose of this breakfast, is to keep you updated. You're all busy, and so rather than you know, spending six weeks trying to get all the information in one hour, I can give it to you. So, who follows Kius Brookmans, the f and economist? Yeah? What, what, do you, um, what do you find from him? Uh, he's a pretty clever guy. Yeah? Um, I, enjoy, I enjoy his writing style. Um, so, he, he replied recently, so... Um, I got an email yesterday. <laughs> so, no, no, he's just not with F&B anymore. Oh, okay, okay. So, no, I mean, he gives it to you as it is. He's a fact. Okay. Anyone else? Got any? Someone else at the back? Same thing. Same thing. I, I, I will be honest with you. I've learned more from Kiers Brokerman's about economics than I learned at university when I studied economics. Because exactly what you said, he makes economics simple for the layman, I, I believe. I've learned more about economics from reading stuff. So, there's an article here which literally came through. Uh, yesterday was 21st. What do we today? <laughs> Wednesday. <laughs> so I got this on Monday. And um, I've just got some points here. Given the deteriorating condition of the SA economy in terms of slowing growth, downscaling of the growth forecast, progressive weaker RAND, loss of investor confidence, risk of more debt downgrades, and upside risk to inflation, while also highlighted recently <coughs> by Saab, the inclination may be to extrapolate such deterioration in the absence of clear political leadership addressing the key issues. He goes on to talk about the concern that with the way things are going from a leadership perspective, so not a macro perspective, but a micro perspective, what we're in control of, that the last time our debt got called in this country was in 1985. And he, the whole, I mean, you can see here, it's a five-page article, I'm not going to read your whole thing. But the whole thing comes down to, the very last line is, one hopes the micro policy makers will choose wisely with only national interests in mind. I would highly recommend reading that article. It's on, uh, it's on your USB. The second one for me is that uh, it's pretty much uh, been, been highlighted by that newspaper article, but it's just talking about the markets defying Zuma, where effectively he came out and tried to instill confidence and unfortunately had the, the complete negative op, uh, effect. The third article for me, which was from Brendan actually sent to me, and I read this two days ago, th this one is extremely concerning to me. It's, it's by a research organization and it talks about the riots in Brazil and Turkey. And, and, and how they can be predicted based on inflation trends and what is actually happening. Riots have broken out across Brazil and Turkey. India, Argentina and South Africa are next on the list. Believe it or not, these things can be predicted by looking at inflation stats and monetary debasement rates. 
Six months ago, Johannesburg-based research house, ETM Analytics, predicted this would happen because two countries, because these two countries are among the worst monetary abusers in the world. The research appears to show a direct link between inflation and social unrest. So, it says this has everything to do with the fact that the South African Reserve Bank and the commercial banking system has been flooding the system with newly minted fiat money for the last three years, pushing the RAND US dollar exchange to its lowest level in years. To have a strengthening currency, one needs a prudent central bank maintaining positive real interest rates, not printing new base money to hand to the banks, which they can then lend to creditworthy people, while those people who don't have access to credit markets or are not savvy enough to invest in inflationary sectors are becoming poorer. And quite concerning, and, and you can't see this, but uh, South Africa is third worst in the entire world based on income and, and uh, discrepancies and, and problems with inflation in terms of where we are, in terms of their predictions. The whole thing that they talk about here is that there's a direct difference between CCI and CPI. So it's two different ways of actually determining what inflation are. And I think really, from, from my perspective, this, this wouldn't have made me as concerned unless I'd uh, done quite a lot of work with Clem Sunter. Who has, has been to any of Clem Sunter's speeches in the last year? Okay, so, so can anyone give us some update in terms of what Clem Sunter said? There are lots of red flags. There are lots of red flags? And, and what did he specifically talk about that was one of the biggest problems? Well, I think labor unrest is one. Okay, so labor unrest, mm. it's exactly right. But he actually talks about the concern of the Arab Spring and what's happened in, in, in the countries north of Africa and, and how we've got 10 million youths that are unemployed. And when they, they basically sat with the political leadership in, in, in North Africa, and they said, why did it happen? They said, the reason it happened was that you've got a whole lot of people that are unemployed and are feeling unheard. And ultimately, they, 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 they go towards the unrest. So the concerning thing from, from Kev Sunton, I'm not going to go into this in detail. I've, I've done webinars with him. We've got live talks. But the concerning thing for me with Clem Sunter is that I did an event with him in September last year. And he's got three probabilities for South Africa. 50% is the best case scenario. So there's a 50% probability we stay in the top performing 54 countries in the world. Then we, the, there's a 40% chance of us dropping to the second um, scenario. And then there's a 10% probability of us going to failed state, which is Zimbabwe, Syria, etc. That was in September last year. Yep. Change. I understand. <laughs> yeah. So when I did the webinar with him in, in February, because um, in September it was just before Marikana, in February when we redid it, it changed to 50, 25, 25, exactly like I said. And uh, this gentleman actually beat me to it. So you've won the first prize. You get to choose. You can either have a 10 rand or one dollar. <laughs> 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 you can have a dollar. There we are. For those of you who have already stolen the currency, oh, we know you're South Africans. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that is our gift. It's 25%. And that, that, for me, is an extremely concerning thing. You know, I'm not, I'm not purported. I'm just, I'm just, I've been following Kim Sunder for about five years. I remember less than a year and a half ago when it was, uh, it was like 60, 40 I think it was 640 North, actually, in terms of, so how oh, that's changed. So, so that article about the, the unrest, and, and, and you know, Ken Sunter, for those of you who don't know, is, is the chairman on Anglo board. So he, he's very closely tied to what's happening in terms of labor relations. The third one, and I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail. If you want to go, I've got whole webinars on this. But, but most importantly, it's what's happening with the land in terms of the expropriation bill and how they're actually changing the onus of, of land rights from the government to the individual. Basically, they wanted to change the right to lawful, reasonable, and procedurally fair administrative action, limits and week third. So what they're going to do is they're going to, they want to be able to identify land for redistribution, followed by a notice of expropriation, after which the expropriating authority takes ownership and possession of the property. It is only after transfer of ownership that the question of compensation is considered. And for me, this, this all comes from the Center for Constitutional Rights. So this is not me just trying to, uh, to, trying to be negative here. And, and she talks about the five most important things. So basically, it's shifting the constitutional burden of land reform to the individual owners. It'll have an impact on the property market as a whole. It will, uh, because effectively, the whole compensation thing will come up. It will threaten the stability of the agricultural industry. And it will it'll affect uh, cooperation between the agricultural sector and government and ultimately it will undermine investor confidence. And for me, from a wealth preservation perspective, 
That is critically important. Is that basically agricultural land or is it all property? Well, so probably is it your house in Santa that's going to no. be expropriated? No, because even look at Zimbabwe, they didn't necessarily expropriate a house in, 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 in Borodot. Mm -hmm. okay. But you were with me in London back in 2004, 2005 at events when they were doing that. And do foreign investors know the difference? Might get spooked, that's for sure. Yeah. So, so basically, the, 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 the policy is to do with agricultural land, is it? It's, it's to do with the fact that the land redistribution is not taking place fast enough. I have no problem with land redistribution. I think it's critical for our country, where in 5% of the population has 95% of the land. But it's because of service delivery and because of, of inability. You can't just take the land and hand and, and, and it over. So, to answer your question, when we were in London, Foreign investors, or any investors for that matter, get spooked, to use your word exactly. And so whether they're taking the farm or whether they're taking a house in Santa, doesn't make any difference. It affects the rights to property ownership, which ultimately affects the entire fundamental foundation of, of wealth. Yes or no? Well, well yeah, it, it, it will undermine uh, people's attitude to investment. But what, what I want to understand is whether the policy is largely directed to agricultural land or whether they're putting encroach on, uh, well, it's not going to be your house in Santon, but what about your five acres with a house out in uh, uh, North Riding or Ramsey or something like that sort it of thing? It can be taken in the that land appropriation. What it means, basically what they're saying, because I've got that issue with the piece of land out there at the moment with the road that they want to build, is if the government deems that that land is necessary for a government project, they'll take it. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think the purpose, I think the purpose of today, and, and this debate is fantastic, but the purpose of today is to just make people aware of it. If it's something that concerns you, go and do more research, you know, in terms of what's happening. But not just to sit naively thinking things aren't happening, in terms of where we're at. And, and the bottom line is, you know, for me, for me, this exact building that we're sitting in right here, a bank gave financing to a developer to build this building, etc., etc. If, if, if I don't care if there's a farm a thousand k's from here that's been taken, it will impact the value of this building. Am I right or wrong? Yes. No. The fourth one is uh, again, if you've heard me do any presentations before, there was research that came out in 2010 that 80% of South Africans that invest overseas. Now it's not just property, whether it's property, stocks, bonds, whatever, actually lose money. And we've done quite a lot of research on this. And, and uh, our business partner, Brendan and I, is he and Henny, actually tried to work out why it was. And our number one reason is that people make crisis investments. They, they wait until the rand is falling, they, they jump on an airplane, they fly to London on a business trip for three days, and they say to themselves, well, I'm going to buy a property. And to be honest, it, if you think about it the other way around, if a, if a British person was to arrive in Johannesburg on a three-day business trip and was going to buy a good investment, what are the chances? Okay. A guy from Atlanta flies out here and rocks up and is going to buy a property. Is it going to happen? He comes on a hunting trip and buys a property at the same time. You know, so the chance of us going to Disney World and buying a property at the same time are equally small. You know, and that's why, unfortunately, people have the right, the wrong information, the wrong partners. They underestimate the cash flows. They don't work with with people that focus on the international property. And and for me, they also underestimate the costs that are involved. One of the things that I learned the hard way, unfortunately, I'm very skeptical of, of off-plan developments. I bought, uh, if you don't know this, in, um, in London in 2008. I had, I had pre-approved finance from Barclays Bank, Barclays Capital. Okay, now, let's be honest, is that fairly good pre-approval? Yes or no? Yeah, I mean, they signed it off. I, I would have thought it's pretty much as good as anything. Then the GFC came along. They went, that piece of paper, thanks for you, not so much. Okay, now I've got my 10% deposit down. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm supposed to get financing in two years. What I don't like about off plan, I don't know where we'll be in two years. So I've become much more pragmatic in terms of I like to buy something I can see, I know what I'm getting, I know what the results are right now today, and I don't have to worry about the risks I can't control in two years. Does that make sense? There is a report that you're interested on the six things you need to know, which based on Brendan and I and Yaku's experience, you know, we, we've been doing it for a long time, just to help you. Whether you work with us or not, we don't care. We just don't want you to go and see and make mistakes. And then lastly, for me, I asked who was here, was at the, uh, was at the extravaganza. Who was on the webinar, or any webinar? We've had three of them with James Painter. Okay, excellent. So, 
Interesting enough, James, if you look at his website right now, he said that, um, this is the front page of his website, he says, are you still looking around for reasons why the RAM has moved uh, when it's too late to protect yourself? Or are you using a tool that shows the future with an 80% accuracy so that you can take action? Now, interestingly enough, we did a webinar with him in January. This is the 16th of January. And he told us that around May, June, we would, be, we would, uh, we would reach the 10 rand target. Since 2005, he's had an accuracy of 81% using patterns. The best way to describe what he does, it's like the weather. You know, we can't, the weatherman is not 100% sure that it's going to be sunny today, but based on weather patterns, he can, he can tell you with a lot more accuracy than we can as to whether it's going to be sunny or rainy. Does that make sense? So, this year was, uh, is what's happened to the RAM since 1990 to 2013. So, we can see it's gone up and down and it's had some spikes. The average devaluation is, uh, is 5.6%. Now, this was the graph that we used in March when the RAND was sitting at about, uh, about 880, 9 RAND to the dollar. Can anyone tell me what the average is? because they were, they were probably know because they were on the webinar, what the average is now across the whole, um, because of why, where the RAND's changed. So if we take since 1990 to today, 23 years, what is the average now? It's no longer 5.6%. Anyone? It's about around 6%. Yeah, it is around 6%. Congratulations. Would you mind just coming up to the front quickly? <laughs> <laughs> Making money, making money. <laughs> you've got a choice. You've got 300 rand or $20. <laughs> <laughs> <Hold on. laughs> so obviously you guys are learning here that if you take part, you're going to make some money. <laughs> hey, I'm sitting in the front, eh? <laughs> Shorter distance. So yeah, interestingly enough, that graph is saying so it's 6% now. <laughs> just to run through, for those of you who weren't on the webinar, it's not just a sentiment thing. It's not just because people don't like what, uh, what Zoom is saying or not saying. Unfortunately, it's based on fundamentals. And there's two major fundamentals that drive it. The first one is our productivity. So the blue line is our productivity since 1981. Okay? And uh, the maroon line is our, productivity, uh, is our trading partner's productivity. And you can see the decrease, the yellow line is the difference between the two. So our productivity has vastly reduced against our trading partners over the last 30-odd uh, years. Our unit labor cost. So the blue is us in terms of unit labor cost, and the maroon is, uh, is our trading partners. So again, there's a stark contrast between the labor cost in South Africa versus our trading partners. And someone asked a very good question on the webinar. Why 2008? Why does it stop? Because some of our new trading partners like China, the research doesn't go back far enough. So it's very difficult to assimilate. But, but can we agree that that trend is not necessarily diminishing, it's actually increasing? Does that make sense? Anyone disagree with that? No. So in March, in March, when we did the extravaganza, you can see here this date, it's the 6th of March 2013. Dave sat with us live, we have a presentation if you want to go and watch it on the internet. And he told us that in the next three months, we would be in a target range of 9.50 to 10.30. That's the green box there. So he's not 100% sure, but the target range for the next three months would be between 9.50 to 10.30. Does anyone know what we were this morning? Or are this morning? What is it? 10.10. 10.10. So can we agree that he's pretty, pretty spot on? Three months later. And the frustrating thing for me is that we have 202 people come to the extravaganza and hear this and be shown this, and then not actually, only about 20 of them took action. And there are 180 people that are sitting there going, if only I'd bought when the RAND was 880, 890, which is what it was at the extravaganza. And so for me, this research now on your USB is all his research. And what he's also agreed to do is for the next month you can get a service for free. So log in, see how it works. I would highly recommend it. I personally pay the subscription for it. Scott, can I, can I jump in? Yeah, yeah. quickly. Um, I did a bit of a spreadsheet before I followed James Painter's stuff, just uh, on the history of the, of the rand versus the dollar and, and the euro and all the rest of that stuff. And, and basically, if in 1996, because that's as far back as my research went, in 1996, if I had a million rand in the bank with no inflation, no growth, no, no gap, whatsoever, and all I did was I kept it in South Africa, 
in today's money would be worth roughly 130,000 Rand in global buying power um, in terms of where the dollar's gone. If you just moved it to the States, you didn't buy property, you didn't get any growth on it, no interest, no nothing. If you just did that, it would be worth between 1.7 and 1.8 million Rand today. Um, so, and that's, that's not investing in anything else except transferring currency from one country to another. And that trend is not slowing down. We can see it's accelerating. Um, and that was my own internal research. It wasn't following uh, the, this guy. I think the important thing is that as a property investor, I don't really care where the rand is going tomorrow or next week or even in the next couple of months because I invest personally with a five-year view plus. So what's more important to me is that over the next couple of years, James's research is pointing that the target area is going to be somewhere between 14 and 21. The only thing he's not 100% sure is how long it's going to take to get there and exactly how high it's going to go. You can read all those documents in terms of there's a whole lot of uh, barrier lines and everything else. He, if you read his research right now, he says the best case scenario with about a 30% probability we should get back to about 9.30 in the next couple of, in the next, uh, in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, but, but quite soon it will break through the 10.50 and once we go there we'll, we'll start to go into, into new areas. So this for me is a, is a basic, uh, a very basic graph that, that I've put together. And for me this is my rand purchasing power and this is the cost of investment. Now the cost of investment could be a skiing holiday once a year. It could be the fact that my son is 15 months old now, and how do I know? He might actually want to go to a foreign university. It might be the fact that I want to go and live in another country one day. It might be the fact that I just want to buy a property. It doesn't matter what it is. It's different for everybody. But for me, the challenge is, is that the rand is doing that, and that the cost is doing that. And ultimately, it's my problems, or my freedom, that is, that is being impl implicated in terms of where I actually am. And you know, I thought about this last night when my son was having that, uh, that, that, uh, that fit and we put him in the car and all I did was drive him straight to, to Santon Medi Clinic. And not at one point did I stop to think, you know, shit, can I afford this? Or is this the best place? Or, you know, how am I going to pay the bill or whatever? And when I was sitting there last night, I thought, I'm in such a privileged position to be able to do that, not to have to worry whether medical aid would cover it or not cover it or anything else. And, and it, for me, it's the exact same scenario in 20 years when he finds out and says, Dad, I want to go to Harvard. You just want to do whatever is best for your kids, you know? I'm not being melodramatic. It's just the exact same analogy for me as to what we're trying to do in terms of freedom. So, just to give you some research, I actually managed to get the research from America yesterday, Brendan. Oh, did you? Tonight. Well done. Um, but unfortunately, I've been struggling to get it from America, so I've got it for Australia. It takes quite a long to plot, uh, time to plot this. But from 1978, which is as far back as you can go, if you've invested the exact same amount of money in South Africa and in Australia, today you would have a net asset value of about 1.2 million rand in South Africa. So the 24th of... Uh, 24th of May, uh, sorry, 24th of June, 2013. If you invested in Australia, you have a net asset value of over four and a half million rand. Yep. Sorry, Scott, is that, um, what percentage of that is due to currency depreciation and what is due to the different property market rate? It's interesting, I've got all the graphs if you're interested. Um, it's probably 50-50. Okay. Like, our property market hasn't necessarily done better or worse. You've obviously also got to take into account inflation. You know, in terms of so the nominal nominal growth versus real growth. You know, in terms of it. But all I'm trying to show is people the impact long term of, of where we're at. The one that I'm actually even more interested in. Well, sorry, that, that's a 400% difference. The one that I'm more interested in is because capital growth is something that I can't necessarily bank on, which I think is asking the question that you're answering. Whereas income is pretty much well, it's not guaranteed, but it's the thing that's important. That's what I can manage. That's what I can control. And doing that exact same research you'd actually see that South Africa was doing better than Australia and then unfortunately started to dwindle and currently we would be sitting at about 89,000 Rand uh, passive income per month in South Africa and uh, about uh, 220,000 in, uh, in Australia. And again, I do have all the research now for, for America so as soon as I update that I will, I will send it through to you in terms of where we're actually at. But it's a 250% difference. So this graph, you, you can't see it I did this on the webinar the other night, and so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on it. But all that I wanted to show, is anyone in the room that is thinking like I was thinking? So, right, damn it, should have bought three months ago when the Rand was 8.99 Rand. Um, tell you what, I'll wait. 
for a year uh, because it's going to recover to nine rand at least. Anyone feel like that? Okay, yeah, 100%. It's common sense in terms of that. So what I thought to myself was, okay, because, you know, the one thing I learned from Anna Australia is that don't rely on, on sentiments, put the numbers down and actually, you know, do the comparison. So I, I, did, a, I did a scenario planning, and what I thought to myself was, I thought, right, we've got two scenarios here. So if I buy a house in Atlanta today, cash, it's going to cost me $120,000. The average growth in America for the last 30 years has been 9.75. In Atlanta at the moment, it's actually quite a lot higher than that on a, on a, on a fair and a basis. But let's be conservative and just work on the long-term average at 10%. The net return, let's work on, uh, on a 9% net return. The RAND is currently, the gentleman at the back said it's 10.10. I'm just going to work on 10 to make it easy. Best case scenario, even though James says the best case scenario is the RAND will recover to, to, uh, to 9.30, I'm going to say it gets even better. It recovers to 9. And I'm going to say the worst case is that it gets to 11. So, if you wait a year, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll email this to you if you're interested. If you wait a year, the property would have gone up by 10%, so it'll cost you $132,000. And in RAND terms, for the two gentlemen sitting at the table there, you'll only be timesing that by 9 RAND now, because remember, it's best case scenario. Happy? Yep. So it'll give you, it'll give you an amount of money, the amount of RANDs you would have to spend in a year would be 1.188. Okay. So the second scenario is that you buy now and you benefit from the capital growth on the property and the income. Because remember, the capital growth is a variable, but the net income is a, is a fairly constant. So it gives you a return, but I'm not so worried about the return, because this scenario is where the RAND stays exactly the same. Nothing changes. The RAND in the year is like 10 RAND for the dollar. Does that make sense? And interestingly enough, just on income, you're 8% better off. And if you take income and capital, you're 18% better off. But the one that, that's the most important for me is scenario three. And scenario three is the, the, the difference between buying now at 10 rand to the dollar, or waiting a year and buying in a year at 9 rand to the dollar. And interestingly enough, if you buy now at 10 rand to the dollar, but you benefit from the income that you would earn on the property, you will still be 7% better off then if you wait, hope and pray that the RAND recovers to 9, and even if it does recover to 9, and you buy then, you would still be 7% better off than if, if you bought today at 10. Does that make sense? And that's with our capital growth. The last scenario, well there's two more scenarios. Scenario 4 is where you, you buy now and the RAND doesn't uh, decrease, it actually gets worse. And it shows you the, uh, that you, you're getting quite a stark contrast. And then lastly, scenario five is where it's very difficult to get financing in America, but if you could get financing and if you could leverage at 50%, it shows you that your return in terms of, even if the RAND improves to best case scenario, so even in a year's time if the RAND improves to nine and you buy today at 10, you're still better off if you leverage it then uh, and, and your total return is obviously higher because you're benefiting from the from the leverage effect. Now, just to show you, I, I, I did all those scenarios, and just like Brendan spoke about, you can see all the numbers there. I wanted to work out my net asset value in dollar terms. I don't really care what my net asset value is in RAND terms. For me, it's irrelevant because I can't determine whether all the things I said earlier. So I wanted to work out my net asset value in dollar terms. And I turned it into, into what I call the freedom graph. And I'm going to put it on, on the PowerPoint because it's easier to see. But basically, in simple terms, the, the first scenario is where I leave my money in the bank at an 8% uh, return. So in South Africa. And I leave it for the next 30 years. So from 2013 to 2043, I have a net asset value of about $250,000. US dollars. That's if I invested 1.2 million rand today. Make sense? Happy? If I, if I bought a South African property, and I don't know if you know this, but the 30 average in South Africa for capital growth is, is uh, 12%. And um, so what I worked on was the 30 average of 12%, and I worked on a net yield of 
Is that is that fairly good? You know, just in terms of fairness, in terms of what we could get home. Yes, no. Yep. Yeah. So if I invested 1.2 million rand with those type of returns over the next 30 years, my net asset value would be about 770,000 US dollars. Option three is if I wait a year and um, and the, the rand recovers to nine rand to the dollar, and I invest in a year, you can actually see the green line only starts a year later. My net asset value if I buy a property in America would be um, about two million dollars. If I buy today at 10 rand to the dollar and I benefit from the income, and this is the advantage of compound or compound growth, I will have about 2.3 million dollars. And then lastly, if I take out a mortgage, then in America I get the leverage effect. And the difference really is 222% between leaving my money in the bank and buying a South African property. It's 174% between buying a South African property and, um, and waiting a year. It's another 10% better to actually take action today than wait a year and hope that the RAND recovers. And lastly, it's another 79% if I, if I uh, look at something where I can get financing. And just to show you the stark difference between the bottom and the top, it's 16 times better. Or between the South African property and the American property, it's, it's four, four times better. So, for, for another award, can anyone give me the definition of the difference between local investing and offshore investing? Rand Hedge? Rand Hedge? Yep. It's actually a formula. No? <laughs> Just before I move on, I, I moved over those numbers pretty quickly. Did that graph make sense? Does it make sense? Does anyone disagree with it or want to debate it before I move on? No? Okay. So, this is a formula. I, uh, I'm a German boy, so I am going to warn you right up front that my Afrikaans is not, not that brilliant. But um, I'm always told the saying, you know, fair upon your hood, no on your skada. Which, from what I understand, is if your goods are a long way away from you, you're going to lose them. Now, I know that there's a lot of people in this room thinking, yeah, yeah, I've got all those graphs on NACA, but how the hell am I going to manage something sitting on the other side of the ocean? Yes, no? Okay. So, for me, the definition of local investing is fair upon your foot, no on your skyder, minus 21%. Because this year, from the 1st of January to today, we've lost 21%, the rand to the US dollar. So unfortunately, I'm not being negative, but I hope you worked hell or hard since the 1st of January and made more than 21%, because otherwise you might as well sit on a beach. It's the truth, unfortunately. That's, that's the fact. For me, offshore investment and offshore return is first world asset growth plus first world income, which equals wealth preservation and global wealth, plus peace of mind, plus plan B. And that for me is what I, what, what I do and why I do in terms of where I am. Right, so no one won the last award. Warren Buffett, we all know who Warren Buffett is. How does Warren Buffett, what is one of the number one things he does to make sure that his investments are sound? Who's read his books? Yeah. Well, I remember from the webinar, he said he gets someone to do print investments, things, find all the things that are wrong with it, and then if he's able to handle what's wrong with it, Fantastic. So does you all hear what he said there? Yeah? No? no? Okay, I'm going to repeat. Do you want a dollar or a rand? Dollar. Interesting. Yes, we didn't bring rand. enough dollars with it. Anyway, uh, so just, just for what they said, well done. That's exactly right. So, so what uh, Warren Buffett says, and I would highly recommend reading his book, Snowball, if you're interested. He actually pays someone to tell him why not to make an investment. So he comes along and he says to, to this gentleman, you're the expert in this. I will pay you if you can prove to me why not to make this investment. But if I buy the investment, I'm not paying you. Does that make sense? Now, compensation drives behavior, which is John Chin's favorite saying. And so, this person's going to do his level best to prove why this, I shouldn't make this investment. And the great thing with that is that Warren Buffett then sits with all the facts. Because can we agree that no matter what investment you make in the world, there is a downside to it? So if you've got all the downsides sitting in front of you, you can look at it, you can say, yes, I can manage that, or no, I can't manage it. If I can manage it, I'll make the investment. If I can't manage it, I don't make the investment. Common sense, isn't it? Yeah. So 
So what we did is, is we learned that, and, and Henny, our business partner and wealth contract, he, we actually went around, uh, Henny, after Brendan and I decided that, that America was really somewhere we needed to go in heavily, Henny came with us in, in August last year. And after looking at all the partners on the ground, John Chin was the guy that we said, that's our guy. That's our guy that we want to actually go out and be that man, the one that actually kills the deal in terms of what's happening. Now, I don't know how much you guys believe in kind of flow and destiny and energy and some of you might say religion, it doesn't matter, whatever. whatever. But the most amazing thing, we sit down with John Chin and we say, would you be prepared to do this service? He says, oh, by the way, I actually own a website, dealkill.com. It's just, it's uncanny, basically. Well, he specializes in doing exactly that. <laughs> he specializes in doing it. So, so and, and I, uh, his whole logic is that if you, if you can't kill it, invest. So, what I wanted to, to just show you was that we just got back from America, and I wanted to share with you just some of the newspaper reports that we found when we were actually on the ground in terms of what was happening there. The first one is that uh, the Dow closed above 15,000, which was the first time it ever did it. I know it's retracted a bit now on the Fed statements, but again, this article is all in there. But it basically said the Dow Jones Industrial Average closed above 15,000 for the first time on Tuesday. This was the beginning of May when we were there. And continued a historic four-year run as investors are finding the returns increasingly irresistible. That concerns me. The next one is uh, about Bernanke. This came out on the 20th of June, so a couple of days ago. The Federal Reserve Chairperson Ben Bernanke said on Wednesday the U.S. economy is expanding strongly enough for the central bank to begin slowing the process of its bond-buying stimulus later this year. He also said that policymakers expect inflation to move back upward toward the long-term 2% goal. The Fed's willingness to dial back on the amount of stimulus it's pumping into the economy reflects the growing confidence in the sustainability and strength of the economy and the recovery. Since cutting interest rates to near zero in late 2008, the central bank has more than tripled its balance sheet to 3.3 trillion to drive borrowing costs down and spur hiring. And interesting enough, the S&P rating agency has just increased America from um, risky to stable, basically. Yeah. The, the committee sees the downside risks to the outlook for the economy and the labor market as having diminished since the fall. It doesn't see rates rising until 2015. They forecast that the U.S. economic growth of between 3% and 3.5% next year and 2.9 to 3.6% in 2015. So that just gives you an idea in terms of the market and, and what we found on the ground from an economic perspective. Then for me, what we found in terms of the property market, I wanted to show you a video quickly and then I wanted to, and then I'll run through some of the newspaper articles. But I think this, this, um, this video by John Chin uh, sums up what I'm trying to say. Hey, Dan, it's Chin here. I had a quick update for you. Just want to kind of bring you behind the curtain on a phone call I just had with one of my close friends who's been in real estate for a very long time, he underwrites a lot of the deals that these institutional buyers are, are picking up. Basically, he takes like a grouping of single-family homes that have been packaged that are cash flowing. He analyzes those before they'll buy them. And we were talking about what's happening in the markets now, what we call these peripheral markets. There's a distinction or a difference between a trophy market and a peripheral market. Um, I'll define the two. The trophy markets are the markets that a lot of our ad, they have national demand and international appeal. So there are your markets like your Orlando's, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, uh, your Las Vegas, your Phoenixes, your Palm Springs. Those are what we call trophy markets. The trophy markets are like some of the worst places to invest right now. I mean, you obviously have little pockets where you can find deals, but if you're doing any kind of volume and you're financially driven, you're looking for financial performance, growth, safety, and uh, yield, then those are very difficult markets to play in. So you see now a lot of us playing in what we call the peripheral markets. The peripheral markets are lesser known markets. The Memphis, Tennessee's, your um, Charlotte, uh, your Charlotte, your Atlanta, Georgia, your St. Louis, your uh, Indianapolis, your Pittsburghs. These markets are less known, but uh, better performing markets in, in a lot of cases because 
you have a lot of times better economic fundamentals, you have prices that are relatively lower compared to the local rents. You might even have higher incomes compared to local prices, so you have a lot more growth potential. Basically a softer ceiling for price, but a very hard floor. So in these peripheral markets, here's what's, what's happening right now. You have those institutional investors playing in the trophy markets first. They pick those things apart. You're talking companies and, and groups with billions of dollars that are buying single-family homes. They're driving the prices up. They're squeezing those yields because the rents aren't going up as fast as the prices are. And then they exit those markets when they can't meet their yield requirements because they're completely yield-driven. So now they're in these peripheral markets, and they're playing with the mom and pop real estate investors like you and me, and they're pushing us out of the picture because they're coming in overpaying for houses because they don't care that the three houses on the street sold for 10, 15, 20, 30 thousand dollars more than the one they're buying, or I'm sorry, uh, less than the one they're buying, because as long as they can buy that house, put the rehab money into it, get into the hands of the property manager and meet their yield department, they're picking that house up, and so they're putting a a lot of pressure on the property price. The property price is going up, and the rent, again, we're starting to see this happening in the peripheral markets now. The rents aren't keeping up with the purchase prices. So what's happening is, here's the interesting phenomenon. They are driving the prices up so much now on the resale inventory. Remember, in the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, through parts of 2011, you had a lot of inventory in a lot of these markets. It's all been depleted now. Sometimes in cases where you have like 14 months supply down to maybe in the land market right now, we have about six weeks of inventory for the stuff that we're looking at. It's hyper, hyper competitive. Properties are selling for a lot more than they're being listed for. Multiple offer situations all over the place, short sales, mango properties, even at the courthouse auctions. It's hyper competitive because we're playing with these billion dollar firms. So what's happening is all of the land that was out there that builders stopped building on back in 2007, 2008. These builders, you have to keep in mind, have been very inactive the last few years because you had so much resale inventory at a low cost per square foot compared to what they could build and put a house out there for brand new and make a profit on. So they've been inactive because they can't make money with all that resale inventory. Well, now that resale inventory is gone. And those resale price per foot has been raised up to where the new construction a builder can come out of the ground and know that they can sell these properties very quickly to end buyers or, in some cases, even these institutions that are willing to contract these houses before a shovel even goes into the ground. So with that being said, the opportunity now is to get a house, a brand new construction house, that is only maybe ten to $15,000 more than its resale equivalent, but it's in completely perfect shape and has a a lot of times the build a warranty in place, you have a lot less headaches as far as maintenance goes, and they yield just as strong, if not stronger, than that resale inventory. So you're going to see me play with more new construction now because we have the same yields and we have lower maintenance, a lot less risk with those types of properties, and in a lot of cases we can get them in the nicer neighborhoods. So I just want to kind of share that with you, give you kind of a, a feel for what's happening in, in, in the climate in these peripheral markets if you're a cash flow residential investor, and uh, hopefully. Uh, as I uncover and continue to validate some things with these emerging markets, I'll be bringing those to you, and a lot of times you can see those with new construction inventory uh, because the resales in there just don't make sense to try to fight for. Um, we'll end up doing a lot better on the growth side and on our yields if we're playing with the newer product. So just want to kind of give you an update on the climate here. I'll catch up with you real soon as I continue to get more deep like that. That out, I think, the end of last week. So, I mean, literally, it's a couple of days old in terms of what's happening. Now, just in my interest, who's met John here personally? I know a couple of you guys. Okay, what, what are your guys' thoughts on him as a person in terms of his investigation, his ability, etc., etc.? Dynamic. Yeah, you agree? Yeah, so dynamic, top of his game. I mean, would you agree that he's the right type of guy for us to have as our guy on the ground? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> He's China. No. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with that? He told the funny joke. The very, very first time he met a South African, the guy came up to him and said, How's it, China? He was like, What are you actually saying? He was like, What are you actually saying? He was like, What are you actually saying? He was like, What are you actually saying?
No, but, uh, but just just some things that uh, that we picked up when uh, when we were when we were there, and, and I'm sure Tony and, and, and Peter and the guys that were with us now in May. Um, these were actually articles that we picked up literally from the newspapers when we were there. One of them, um, it's all in your USB survey. Over 50% of Americans expect the home prices to rise. More than half Americans now expect the country home prices to climb within the next year, illustrating a growing optimism towards the health of the home, the housing industry. Crossing the 50% threshold marks a significant milestone, as most Americans believe the housing recovery is truly occurring throughout the country. Considering they've got 300 million, not necessarily highly educated people, but certainly more educated than we've got, um, I think it's quite important to understand that that sentiment has now shifted quite dramatically in, in the right direction. The other one that's very important is that the funds see an opportunity in real estate. I think um, this one I'm not going to read in too much detail, but uh, you really need to understand the impact that the funds are, are having. The, sec uh, the third one is that U.S. home builders' confidence soars to a seven-year high, which is very much what John was talking about there. For the first time in seven years, most U.S. home builders are optimistic about home sales, a sign that construction could help drive stronger economic growth in the coming months. The housing recovery is looking more sustainable and should continue to boost economic growth this year, offsetting some of the drag from higher taxes and federal spending cuts. Steady hiring and low mortgage rates have encouraged people to buy homes. The increased demand along with tight supply of homes for sale has pushed the home prices. And then uh, this one here is that the, 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 the recent research is that the property market is now up over 10% for the last year, which is the best increase it's had in nearly seven years. The rebound in house prices is heavily driven by the western states. Eight of the top ten appreciating markets is in California, with Phoenix and Las Vegas rounding out the list. And then lastly, there's one actually here, because for me it's not all about being positive, it's also about being negative, keeping your feet on the ground. I know when Peter was there, um, he went with the attitude of understanding what's happening and, and trying to punch holes in the, in, the, in the story, if you want to call it that, which I think any wise investor should be doing all the time. You know, it's never always good. So there's an article that I've got here about signs of a new housing bubble in several, several areas. One of the, only a year after the, US, after the US housing market hit bottom, it may be bubbling again. Odd as it may seem, some economics warn the steady rise in house prices, at least in some markets. However, when you go on to read about it, it talks about all the areas that they're worried about from a bubble perspective are the ones in California, Los Angeles, Phoenix, and Las Vegas. So all the top ten that they just said had the highest rises are also the ones, which ties back to what John Chin was saying, because that's where the big funds have gone in, that's where the trophy markets are, that's where the international investors have bought up first in terms of, in terms of where we're actually at. So just to give you some updates on some of the markets, in Orlando, Orlando's had 12% capital growth this year. It's up 38% from, from the low of 2010. Its inventory is at its lowest since 2006. And our partners on the ground there, the thing that we like about Orlando is that its anchor tenant is Disney World. It's not susceptible to tourism. So they had 50 million people come through the airport before the crash. They had 49, people come through, 49 million come through the airport at the lowest point of the crash and they're back to 50 million. And the, the type of tenant that you've got there is someone who's working at Disney World, 100,000 people are employed by Disney World, SeaWorld, and Universal Studios. And just to give you an idea that uh, what, we, what we've got in, in, uh, in Orlando is very much what South Africans are used to. Uh, sorry, I'm using my Mac for the first time presenting. And when I went to the Mac store, they said, once you go Mac, you can never go back. And I said, that's because you've killed yourself. <laughs> um, so, just to give you an idea, it's, it's very much what some of are used to. It's the usual sectional title, two-bedroom, one, two, and three-bedroom apartments. You can see there, this is all on your USB. <coughs> The type of property prices are in and around the 70, probably between 65 and, and say so $80,000. Um, you can see that in terms of if they need to be renovated, the renovation cost. The only thing one needs to take into account in Orlando is that you've got the Homeowners Association. Now, in South Africa, can we agree that your body corporate fees are about 0.1%, maybe 0.15%, but 
Let's just for simplicity's sake say 0.1. So if I buy it for a million rand, I should pay about a thousand rand a month. Happy? Yeah? No, it's higher than that. It's higher than that? Yeah. So you say 0.15%. Yeah. Percent. Yeah. Okay, so let's say 0.15%. So let's say it's 1,500 rand a month. At least. Okay, at least if I'm spending. You're probably right, okay? Mm -hmm. So can we agree that a property price is here devalued to 500,000? My body corporate rate would still be one and a half thousand a month. It can't change because the electricity still costs the same, the gardener costs the same, etc., etc. So the problem you've got in Orlando is that if you look this property in, uh, in 2006, 2007, the last sales price was two hundred and ten thousand dollars. Now you're buying it for seventy-four thousand dollars, and so the percentage, the homeowners association, the body corporate fee takes a, a quite a high percentage of the net yield. It's just something that one needs to take into account in, in Orlando. However, on the positive side, you have a body corporate, so you don't have to worry about the maintenance, etc., etc., in terms of what people are looking at. So this, this here is a, is a two-bedroom, two-bathroom, 1,000 square foot, which is about 100 square meters apartment. They all come within uh, complexes with pools and facilities and, uh, and everything else. And you can, you can see the, the full cash flow in terms of what one can expect in terms of the insurance, the property management. Just lastly, in terms of a map, very simply, that there is the center of Orlando, over there. That there is the airport down there. This is Disney World, Sea World, Universal Studios. This road here, the R4, is the main road. It's like, I don't know, I suppose the N1 going between, uh, through kind of Johnson and Victoria. This property is based there. The best area of Orlando is, is what they call I the northern suburbs. Sorry, I, I couldn't see the where, where's the property. Yeah, the house. The house. Okay. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, so the best area in Orlando is the northern suburbs. It's, it's like effectively the northern suburbs of Joburg here, yeah, where it's the older areas, the more traditional areas, it's where the various schooling districts are. But then the nice thing is the tenant can jump on the R4 and, and be straight down to work in either the city. Universal, SeaWorld, Disney World, Airport, everything is it's, it's well located in terms of its location. So I'm a bit surprised Orlando is not a trophy market. Everyone's heard of it. It was a trophy market, and uh, and what John, it is a trophy market. And what John Chin said is one has to be very specific and and be very picky in terms of because it's already had a lot of capital growth. So, but we not we we not interested in the high end properties. So a lot of people, are particularly like in Miami, so Miami more than Orlando. A lot of the South American money has come in and bought trophy apartments, you know, really nice apartments on the beach in, in downtown Miami, etc. In Orlando, they've gone for the, for the vacation rentals, the more expensive houses, etc. We're talking more about the apartments that kind of the middle income American would be, oh, would be working at. Yeah, condos, yeah. Using their language, yeah. Sorry, so, but what's stopping those people in Orlando purchasing the properties themselves? They can't get mortgages. So the banks are the banks are not lending. There's one apartment complex in the whole of Orlando that the banks are lending against. Think about it if you're a bank. Okay, if I lend to you and you want to buy a house, okay, um, my only risk is whether you pay for the house or not. Fair enough. But there's a percentage that it comes in. So for example, if they had to give 100% loan, yes, high risk if you do it. Yep. 50% if they're out, it's great you do it. Okay, but yeah, you've worked there. okay, I'll explain. I'll explain that. But let's for now just. I just want to stay between the house and the apartment because it's important. I'll answer your question. I will come back to you. But now, Clive over here, you want to buy a house. So my risk is only will you pay me or not. Okay. Clive wants to buy an apartment. Now I've got a problem because what happens if 50% of this apartment is 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 uh, being repossessed and not paying their body corporate? The homeowners association is the word they use there. Is not being paid. The lifts are not being looked after. Now I repossess the unit or club. Great, but what do I do? I'm still within the complex. I've got a lot more risk that I can't manage because I can take back just this unit, but I'm in the complex. So what the banks are very nervous, and it's not just Orlando thing, it's across the whole of America. They're very nervous about lending to individual investors or, or homeowners on an apartment because they can't control the whole complex. Does that make sense? So that's why the banks, there's very, it's very difficult to get back financing for anything, but they'll finance a home at the moment before they'll finance an apartment, which, is a downside if one looks at it, but it's actually an upside because it's keeping the prices. That's why you're buying at seventy-four thousand dollars when the original price used to be two hundred and ten thousand. I'll answer your second question because I think it's very relevant to everyone else. Why is the average American not buying? And if anyone who's been to America wants to jump in, you know, say, tell me because. But but the three things that Brendan and I picked up 
when we were there in April last year. The first thing is that the average American has taken an absolute psychological hiding. Okay, about 8 out of 10 people we met in April last year had lost a property. So not necessarily their home, but like Dolph de Roos, his secretary had lost an investment property, had been repossessed. Okay, so their attitude is, psychologically, this whole property thing is solid, I'm not interested. Does that make sense? The second thing is that when they lost that property, they now got a bad credit rating. It takes between 3 to 7 years, depending on how they lost that property, to fix that credit rating. So, even if I want to buy that apartment, or that house, or the house, or the apartment, whatever, I can't get it because I've got a bad credit rating. And the third thing is, is that, to use your example, so the bank says, right, there's quite a lot of risk here. Let's work on a 70-30 split, bonus value. Well, I don't have 30%, so I can't, I can't do it. The Americans actually measure how much money they're going to spend by the repayment. Um, so, if you're driving around and you're looking at houses, it's like, how much is the repayment? If they're looking at cars, they don't actually advertise the price of the cars, they advertise how much it's going to cost per month. Um, so they don't save, uh, so they don't have the deposits, which means they can't buy. And even if they do have the deposits, a lot of the properties that we look at are repossessed properties, and they still need to be renovated, refurbed, etc. So in the likes of uh, Atlanta, as an example, the guys are spending between, on average, thirteen dollars to $15,000 in renovation. So they, not only the deposit, they don't have that to, to get it to a state. Does that make sense? Freddie Mac's trying to implement a new thing now for first time home buyers where they, they put down a 3% deposit um, and then they can get the house with the 3%. But then they will also give them a further $5,000 for refurb if it's a first time homeowner and they're still not selling houses. So uh, even the 3% is too much for people to go for, which is scary. They're trying to incentivize um, people to buy and it's still difficult. And not to mention the fact that there's only four weeks of inventory in certain of those markets that we're playing in. So even if they do want to buy and they do have the 3%, there's no stock. So um, it's, it's becoming more and more difficult for them to take part in the market. The condos would have a more difficult exit then if people, yeah. banks won't lend. If you, if you wanted to exit today, yes. In, in five years' time, I would see no concern with that because the banks will come back into the market and lend. And in somewhere like Orlando, the, the complexes now are you know, that you don't walk around and see the repossessed apartments all over the place, like here in some other areas. You know, so it will change. So it's, it's like anything in life. There's a pro and a con to everything in life. You're buying it at a reduced rate, but, but that is a potential risk later down the line. But I, see, I would see that changing with no problem in, in later, later, later down the line. And, and the purpose in property anyway is to build a portfolio, it's not to sell necessarily. To Correct. Well, that's one of the things for me. I don't go into the attitude of wanting to sell. So. Well, you have to have an extra strategy. You do have to have an extra strategy. But that's, why, but that's why I told you about it. Yeah, you're not going in, with, you're going in with the eyes open. Remember the Warren Buffett? Yeah. Everything's got its downside. As long as you know about it, that's, you know, the house <laughs> it's, it's a potential. So, in terms of Atlanta, some of the stuff that, uh, that's happening in Atlanta is fascinating. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this because you've got all the articles. But I would recommend you read it because you really need to know what's happening with regards to the funds. Blackstone, a private equity firm, has spent more than $4 billion on 24,000 rental properties in the last year making it the largest buyer in the U.S. It's purchased residents from building and land technology. Um, it's, it's the single biggest uh, family rental division of Blackstone. They, um, that's everything from that article. This one here says that uh, private equity firm hedge funds and individuals are racing to buy in a shrinking pool of foreclosures or distressed homes to rent. They're seeking to profit as prices remain 29% below their 2006 peak and potential buyers can't get mortgages with the banks restricting credit. Blackstone's global head of real estate said in an interview last week that it's getting harder to acquire properties for profit as competition intensifies. Blackstone, the world's largest private equity firm, is leading investors in transforming an industry that historically was a mom and pop business with Goldman Sachs Group Incorporated estimates is worth $2.8 trillion into an institutional asset class. They've targeted such states as Arizona, California, Florida, and Nevada that were the hardest hit by the housing crash. Competition in Atlanta has pushed out some local investors who have complained they can't compete with the institutional firms that are willing to pay the higher prices. So that was everything from that article. And then uh, this one here was about Atlanta it's had the largest growth rate in, in, in nearly seven years. In a sharp turnaround over the past two years, house prices are zooming up in more markets amid big declines in supply 
of homes for sale. The Standard & Poor Case Shiller Home Price Index that tracks 20 different cities said that Atlanta had risen by 16.5%, the largest increase in its 21-year history. So, for me, in terms of Atlanta, it's, it's, it's a very dynamic market, and it's extremely difficult in terms of what's happening on the ground. But for those of you who have met RJ, I'm sure you will agree that he's a fairly dynamic individual himself. So a year ago, we were buying properties on the auctions. That was easy. You just went to the auctions and bought the properties. Now he's got a myriad of different ways to uncover the, the real opportunities. You've got to have someone on the ground kicking the doors down to find the opportunities in terms of where the market is and, and what is happening. And just to give you, to give you an example of... Um, of some of the types of uh, types of opportunities from there. So, in terms of the in terms of the demand. What they, have, uh, what they have done in, in some of the areas with uh, Atlanta to try and keep the, the prices competitive and to also keep the yields competitive, they have also looked at some of the, some of the further out suburbs. So you'll see here this particular property. It's $90,000, built in 2002. It's got a net yield of 8.5%, and, uh, and the size of the property is uh, 1,300, so about 130 square meters in terms of that. This property here is about $98,000. It's a, it's, a, it's a brick place. You can see their net yield of about 8% and the size about 1,150 uh, square meters. Fortunately, the picture's, the picture's not a great one there. But we've got all the videos and, and everything. I'm going to show you now quickly. This one here is actually uh, rented out and it's $107,000. And again, we, you can see that these pictures are all pre-rehab in terms of, we can tell because RJ's got a fairly standard, um, what do you call it, landscaping. This is Covington. I, I like Covington personally in terms of the area. So this particular property is 123000 Again, it hasn't been renovated yet. You can see all the landscaping hasn't been done. A net yield there of, of 78 And then the prices there are including renovation. So everything will be done in... Full turnkey. Are those mostly sort of wooden constructions? Yeah. In Atlanta, it'll be oh, mostly wooden. The greatest. <laughs> <laughs> so the problem that it brings you. There, it works. Um, and they're used to it. So, so here's another property, 127. It's 2,228 square feet, so about 220 square meters. So, you know, very much an American traditional home. We find a lot of people that go over there actually look at the properties and think, you know, wow, I could, I could happily live here myself, you know, in terms of, in terms of the uh, size. And that one's got a net yield of 8.3%. And then lastly, the kind of the more upper end, about 133, so a mixture between uh, facade and, 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 and brick. And this one here, a net yield of 8.2% and a purchase price of 133. And then lastly, that, that one body suit is actually tenanted as well already. And this one here is uh, 2004, it's 1,900 uh, square meters. And I just want to show you the video here quickly. This is Stuart Ray Covington and today we're here at 301 Clarion Drive in Carrollton, Georgia. This is in Mountain Creek subdivision. Let me give you a quick tour of the subdivision. It's a nice, quiet subdivision, well maintained. This home here, as you can see, is. A so I'm not going to go through the full video, but on any property, we've got the full surround. You can it goes around the suburb, it goes into the property in terms of what's happening. Yep. Yes. So it's a net yield, basically. So it takes it, it takes into account the rates and taxes. It takes into account the management fee, the expenses. Yep. So. Uh, so it's pre-tax, basically. Okay. So it's, it would be a net yield pre-tax. Does that make sense? Yeah. You, happy, you happy with that, Stuart? Would you agree with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Typically, what is the length of the lease and, and what's the escalation to the from? And does the uh, managing agent guarantee occupancy? Okay. So 
couple of questions there. Everything in America is dependent on the area. So in Orlando, traditionally you're looking at a 12-month lease. In Memphis, the lease is about 23 months on average. In Atlanta, it's a three-year lease. They've got an option there where they call it a three-year a three lease option. So the tenant actually goes into the house. They have the option to buy the house in three years at a, at a, at a much at a higher rate. Um, the, the, it, it's not an exit strategy to, to use your thing. It's just to get the right type of tenant into the property and to get them to sign on a three-year lease. You get them to also sign at a higher rent than, say, what, what they're getting you know, in the same street. Because what happens is the mom and pop arrive and they, they say, right, the, the renovations are really good, high standard, this is what I want. Now, the guys that we work with, the management company there, they get thousands of applications. It's not about getting someone through the door, it's about getting a quality person through the door. So to answer your question, they don't guarantee the, the, the rent. It's not a rental guarantee. There's no, it's not added in any price anywhere or whatever. And it's very much a case of trying to get the best tenant into the property because that's what's going to determine your long-term return. Does that make sense? In terms of what? So, I mean, we have found, I know mean, student beverage testers, sometimes it might take a little bit longer in terms of, but what Ojo always says, wait, just wait until you've got the right person to, 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 to move into the property. Um, but generally, they say to us, or, you know, you, you should be you should be working on a vacancy of between 30 to 45 days <coughs> on average. Okay. Does that answer all your question? 30 to 45 days over the three-year period, or well, because you get period. generally generally the person moves in and stays for the three years. They do have mm -hmm. a guarantee in place. This is the guarantee they do have. If someone leaves within the first 12 months, they'll replace them um, without a, paying the new fee. So the, the, you know, the, the placement fee or whatever. And they've also got an eviction guarantee as well. So if they place the wrong guy in the first year and he doesn't pay, they will evict him at their cost uh, and place a new tenant at their cost. And then the uh, escalation of the rentals? Oh, sorry, I didn't answer that question. So in, uh, in somewhere like Orlando, they just, what I've found in personal countries, I've invested in London, Australia and America, uh, tends to stick just to inflation. So it's not as aggressive as South Africa. You're looking at, I will, my budgeting, we work on 2%. Okay. Um, in Atlanta, when they sign that three-year lease, there's no escalation. So they, they fix the person in for three years, and, and that's the way, that's the way. So that's about getting the right tenant. But again, their attitude is get the person at the right price from the start, and, and not necessarily worry from an escalation perspective. I understand where you're coming from, but it's also different in a low inflation environment. It's not quite the same as, as here. Three years, no vacancy is better than an escalation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the attitude. Try to get the right tenants in. Make sure you've got the right person up front. One thing, uh, Scott, with um, these houses are what, 10 or 20 years old? No, uh, generally less than 10 years old. Because when John Chin was talking, he was saying that uh, uh, the resale stock of that market has gone and it's uh, new building stock uh, coming to market now uh, in the peripheral market. So it would be fairly newly built houses, and yet that's a bit different from these examples here. Different markets are different. I'm going to show you some stuff now quickly. Everywhere's different. You know, the, the thing with America, in South Africa, I think we can pretty much safely say that kind of what's happening in Johannesburg is happening in Cape Town. Pretty much. More or less. Yes, no? Do you agree with this group? Cape Town is a bit more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but I mean, it's not stark contrast. Mm. You know, Cape Town is not booming and uh, Job is busting. Do you know what I mean? Whereas in America, it's, there's massive stark contrast all over the country. So if you say to me what's happening in the American market, you've got to be very specific which market. And so to answer your question, and I'm going to show you some, some of the new construction in terms of where we're at. Memphis, Memphis for me is uh, interesting enough. There's an article here about Memphis, uh, one? where this came out in April, and actually Memphis is the best performing yield market in the whole of America. So this, was, this came out by the Wall Street Journal in, in, in April. It's in your uh, magazine, uh, in your USB. And Memphis was literally, so it found that Memphis was the most profitable place to rent out single-family homes in the whole of America with a, with a net return of over 10%. Now, we, we've been going to, Me to Memphis since April last year, Brent and I. And when we originally went, we were very attracted by the returns because it was net returns of even 20% plus. But I'll be honest with you, in terms of the properties, they, were, they classed them in Memphis an A, a B, a C, a D, and an E. And what we originally saw were D's and E's. And it just, 
You know, they talk about curb appeal in America, which is when you drive up, does it look nice from the curb? You know, it's fairly self-explanatory. Now, Memphis, the properties aren't as curb appeal and aren't as nice looking necessarily as, say, Atlanta, but the yield is, is very attractive. The D's and E's, though, for us were, were too far down the, the scale because our investors, and, and our, with our own money, if I want to make a really stark, you know, high yielding investment, I can go and invest in the CBD of Johannesburg. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if I want to take that type of risk, let me do it in Joburg where I can at least try and manage the risk, etc., etc. I don't want to be doing that equivalent type of investment in a foreign market. So what we got excited about in October last year, and I'm not sure if anyone, you were. You with us in October, no. You, no, you, yeah, sorry, Dustin, you with us in October. So if you, Dustin will attest to this. As we pulled out from the airport, I pulled over and I was like, look, you know, guys, I'm just warning you, you know, what we're about to see doesn't necessarily look that great, uh, but we're going to meet a new management company. And we all walked in that day and we were overwhelmed by how professional the company was, the whole operation, what they're doing in terms of marathon management and Hewlett and, and the team that they're there. And we've now grown that relationship with what they're doing, and, and uh, they've got a full turnkey there where they're finding the houses, they're renovating the house, and they're doing the full management. It's one of the things we've learned in, in property, and I'd highly recommend taking this lesson, is that you want to deal with someone that has everything under one roof, because they have the responsibility. If they tell you they're going to raise it for $1,000 when they sell it to you, then, then it's their responsibility to make sure they get you $1,000 when they actually manage it. Does that make sense? It's when you lend it out to your to a state agent friend that you've got the problem. In terms of where it's at. So that's, that's really for us Memphis. The, the yields in Memphis are, are very attractive. And um, just, to, just to show you in terms of just, just some opportunities, as I said to you, this, this year, now this is pre renovation, I am warning you, so it doesn't come with the grass and the roof. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but these, these properties are all, all bank repossessed properties. So our class. A's generally are from a price point of about $90,000 through to about $120,000. The class B's are from about $70,000 through to about $90,000. And the class C's are from about, say, $55,000 through to about $70,000. And we only target those three, so A, B, and C. In Memphis, you can get 50% financing, which is, which is really attractive because it can make your money go further. And the yields tend to be the net yields between 9 and, say, about 12%, I'd say, in terms, in terms of what And they obviously slide down according to Ellie. If you're buying really nice, expensive ones in the A-class properties, you're going to get like 8%, 9% yields thereabouts. Uh, but if you're buying B-class, you're going to get 9 10%. And if you buy C-class, you're going to get 10 12%. Uh, so in terms of uh, the, the different areas and the different classes of properties. I think Marathon, the thing that really impresses us with Marathon, they've got over 1,300 properties under management, about 400 international investors already. They've got, a, they've got an online portal system, so you've got complete transparency in terms of what's happening with your property and, and knowing exactly in terms of the investment. And the thing that I like from a financing perspective, which Dustin and I found out back in October last year, is that the financing comes from private money from Wall Street. It's only offered to four companies in the whole of America. And they don't lend the money based on you and how much money you earn in South Africa. They lend it on the property in Memphis and the fact that Marathon can collect the rent. So the loan value is actually based on 44 months rent, which for me as an income investor is incredibly valuable because it shows me the fact that they've done their due diligence and they're prepared to lend money against that property and that company. It's not really important who I am. That, that for me is, is, is really important. But this is very powerful because... Um a lot of times what people, uh, one of the ceilings they hit in South Africa to invest more is affordability. You've got to show the banks what they want to see in order to get more home loans. In the States, uh, with Memphis in particular, is it's not about what you earn. It's about do you have the deposit, and if you do, it's what the, the income can be produced out of the property. That's what they're going to loan against, which means you can grow the portfolio uh, organically quite, quite aggressively. Well, they look at the business behind it. Yes. Typically then... On those categories A, B, and C, what would be your loan to value to wash in on, on the uh, on the rentals? Most people are borrowing at a 50% loan to value, and you clearing it by a couple of hundred dollars. So you you could actually you can't borrow higher than 50. If you could, I reckon you could go up to probably uh, 70, 75 percent, and, and be and have cash flow. What makes Memphis special? Elvis. Elvis. <laughs> 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 
Uh, it's, a fan, it's a fantastic question. It's a fantastic question. And to be honest, please oh, take, please please take a dollar more around. Yeah. 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 Because it's a great yeah, question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a very good question. And a lot of people, you know, Memphis isn't on the radar. Memphis is a distribution center. So it's got the biggest river in America, the Mississippi. It's got uh, all the major railway lines that go north, south, east, west, actually go through Memphis. It's got all the major rail, all the major roads, the highways in America, also go through Memphis. There's more trucking head offices based in Memphis than anywhere else in America. And it's also got one of the biggest airports. Uh, it's a word that Eric used at the, at, called an aerolopolis. I've never heard of it before. But it basically is an airport that's for distribution. And so FedEx is there. Do you know that FedEx, just FedEx Airport, is bigger than the whole of Cape Town Airport, Cape Town International Airport? Okay. There's like 30,000 staff, etc. So to answer your question, the capital growth in Memphis has been, on average, for the last 30 years, 4%. It's not really, it's, it's more of a rental market. You're dealing with blue collar people, Nike has their distribution center worldwide. Any Nike products that are made worldwide go to Memphis and then the distribution. Disney has exactly the same thing. So it's very big, solid. Uh, so for us, it's, they, our partners, uh, Marathon, don't actually invest in 60% of members. Um, and again, I mean, can you agree that it's worth investing with a guy like Hewlett that personally owns about 110 properties himself? His business was born out of necessity because he is an investor himself. So to answer your question, Hewlett's the guy that owns Marathon. Thank you. Okay. Um, his passive income, uh, can you remember the number, Tony? It, it was like 65,000 US dollars, I think, a month, just out of his properties. Um, you had a question yeah. So what is the, the history in terms of, of rate escalations, etc., on, on properties in the States? Do rate escalations being capital growth talking about? Or services or services? Oh, in terms of services and stuff. It's a good question. I, um, I, I, couldn't, uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to give you a guaranteed answer, but from my experience in, in both London, Australia, and in, uh, and in America, remember I've only been investing in America for last year personally, so, but even in London where I've been investing, I bought my first house in London in 2002, your rates tend to be very marginal in terms of sticking with inflation and in a low inflation environment. They haven't gone up. It's not like here where it jumps 20%. No. But you signed a three year lease yep. with nothing, and you got in a 2%, whatever it is, annual escalation on, on services costs. <coughs> yeah, look, it's a, look, in terms of the. It's a, it's a valid point. Um, I don't know, Brendan, from your perspective, if. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's so, it's One so of the things um, it doesn't actually affect your yeah, rental return. It doesn't return, affect your rental return. I mean, if it goes from, uh, let's call it $1,600 a year to $1,700 a year, uh, I mean, it's an extra $100. In terms of your total net yield of, let's call it $9,000, it really makes no impact on it, you know, whatsoever. And what they do do, which I think is very important, yeah, I wanted to bring is that what they do do is they actually fight the rates on your behalf. Yeah. So in Atlanta specifically. In Atlanta um, not, specifically, they're constantly yeah. fighting on your behalf to make sure the rates are, are relevant. You know. Because what, what so might have really happened is so um, if the property was last <laughs> sold in like 2006, 2007 at 200 or, two, or $300,000, then the rate is measured against that valuation. Whereas if you're buying it now at $120,000 or $100,000, they go and get it re-evaluated to lower your, your tax base. I think so one of the things we've got the point to do with the uh, lenders and marathon. Are we saying that uh, the lenders will lend up to 50% of the value of the, the property because Marathon is such a good quality uh, manager and collector of rents and whatever? True. And, and they've, they've scoured America, and there's only four companies in the whole of America that they lend with and in terms of management companies because it's the management collecting rent. Does that make sense? I wanted to point out something that Tony mentioned, and now he's not here to defend himself, so you'll have to, you'll have to watch the testimonial. But he mentioned on the testimonial, everything that we learn, because a lot of the questions you're asking are very valid, but you know, I believe that when we live in a cowboy country, you have to act like a cowboy. And here, it's, 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 we're on the battlefield, and we're constantly trying to protect ourselves, and how do we do this, and protect this downside, and sort this out, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of that stuff doesn't happen in first world countries. And I, the testimonial that, that Tony gave, and I'm not sure if anyone else feels like that that's been with me to America, what, what, what happens on the ground there, and, and we come from this, Tony, you're back in the room, I'm talking about you. Um, but no, I mean, just, you know, for me, what, what we learn here in terms of our, 
call it push, we have to warfare if you want to, to make sure that we, you know, our rates going up and stuff. It's a very valid question. There it's not a uh, concern. You know, it doesn't, there's not just some guy decides to put up rates 20% and you now suddenly impact it dramatically, you know, so. I'm just about um, finding new medicine. <coughs> the medicine. I'm just about finding new medicine. Yeah. 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 Very good question. Um, having done this for 10 years and helped <coughs> over 2,000 people invest, a lot of it comes from experience, being able to go in and ask the right questions. I will, I will quote Brendan. When we left Memphis in April last year, he said, why are you being so negative? Those were his exact words. And so to answer your question, we didn't go there looking for opportunity. We actually went there, like I said, Peter, with punching, trying to punch holes in terms of do these guys, you know, how big is their portfolio? Because, you know, Joe Soap is managing 20 properties for his cousin, you know, I, I'm a big believer, and if there's any management agents in the room, I apologize. Um, finding you know, a good management agent is an oxymoron. Finding an internationally good management agent is, is virtually like impossible. Okay. So to, to answer on that basis, we then go on, on uh, networks. So people that we've worked with, etc., etc. So like a guy like John Chin now, and I'm about to show you an opportunity in a new city. I haven't even been to that city, but I've got a huge respect for John Chin and his ability to go and, and to ask the right questions and to make sure. And we all understand that the management is 80% of buying the property, and buying the property is 20%. You know? And you know, I think that is, is critically important, you know, um, in, in terms of the... But to, to put that in perspective, I mean, we didn't uh, choose these areas just by, you know, out of a hat. We looked at a whole bunch of areas, about 14 or 15, I think, in the last year, from San Diego, Miami, Chicago, Boston, uh, Phoenix, North Dakota, Vegas. Phoenix, Vegas. I mean, we, we've we've been everywhere and we've met a hell of a lot of people and they just get scrapped. Eh? We're like, no, I can't deal with those guys. No, they're, they're the wrong type of people. No, we don't trust those people. No, I mean, it's, it's been a hell of a thing to go through for us to try and figure out who the hell do we deal with. Um, and then at the same time, a lot of times, we've invested ourselves. Uh, so it's not like I'm saying, you know, buy this wonderful house in Atlanta because uh, I'm not there. I'm also in Atlanta with my own personal money because of the quality of the partners. I'm also in Orlando. Um, and I would buy in Memphis if we didn't have a waiting list, so the clients kind of come first at the moment. But uh, I'd, I'd be active in that market too. The problem is we can't get enough B-class properties. I particularly want a B-class property. I think it's right there in the, in the middle because of the quality of the management. I mean, if anybody's met Hewlett and, and Eric over there, they are phenomenal at what they do. Um, so at the moment, because of that and the fact that we can get finance over there, it's, it's incredible. So we've drilled it down to these three areas and we're unlocking one more, but it's because of the management that we're prepared to but do I think also, I think also sorry, just quickly, it's also a case of being dynamic. Okay, so in Orlando as an example, we had a management agent that we met in April last yeah. year. The guy told us all the right stories. I was blown away and I thought, right, this guy's perfect. He ticks all the boxes. And then his communication was yeah. horrendous. You know, he showed us all the online thing and everything else. I know that, um, I know that Stuart and Bev, we, we, had a, we had a concern with Ida, you know, in terms of, and, you know, so we've actually upskilled on in, internally on our side so that we can make sure that things like that are sorted, we can stay on top of people. Because, you know, nothing happens in property just randomly. It doesn't work like that, you know. So when we learn and we, we find out there's mistakes, we make sure that, we can, we can do it. And then if a partner like in Orlando, in, you know, Atlanta, it, we've had a conversation with them, you know, when, and, and, uh, and hopefully we, we, there's no problem there. But, but in Orlando, as an example, we scrapped the guys and we moved, like everyone, to, to a new management agent because we weren't happy with the quality. So it is a dynamic thing as well, you know, in terms of what's happening. Your yeah. What's your criteria if you're looking at Memphis, all these different areas? What is the first three criteria or whatever it is that has to be met before you go into more depth. Uh, Perfect. Great question. I hope everyone's going to have got time to all talk. talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, it's a fantastic question. Um, the first question is partners. Because, like Brendan said, the first time we did it, we did eight cities in 11 days. If, if you think I'm joking, we, and uh, ask anyone that's been on a trip with me, they know it's pretty hectic anyway. We were literally flying into a city at night. We were getting to our hotel at about 11.30 at night. We were waking up at 7 o'clock in the morning, catching a taxi to our partner, being shown around for the day, getting our partner, because we literally took our luggage with us, to drop us at the airport at about 5, 6 o'clock to fly to the next city. And we did that for eight cities in a row. So that was in April last year. And so it's, it's, I'm just giving you the background of how, I mean, we had one day to make these type of decisions. The first thing came to partners. What is your experience? What is your track record? Do you do international property? Do you know, because it's very different dealing with 
an investor who's local versus dealing with someone who's international. Secondly, what is the full solution? Do you have a management and maintenance? You know, it's, it's not just, I've said this so many times, not just about buying the property. Who's going to manage the property, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanted to meet the whole team. You can see, for me, I often say we invest in people first, then property. The second thing for me was, uh, was the, the income. So, right, the, the management company ticks the box. Is there a rental demand? Like, you know, it's all good and well. I looked at property. I went to America in 2010 for five weeks with my wife. We went to, we went to met five different companies. I went to all the different uh, major states that I looked to. I personally want to invest in. I didn't invest one cent. I came home. Um, reason being, I couldn't find someone on the ground I could trust. And secondly, we didn't believe that we could collect the income. And I believe, firstly, if you can't collect the income, you're wasting your time. Okay, so that's my second criteria. The third one is the fundamentals. What is driving this market? What makes this market different from another market? And, you know, so, so let me just... I don't know, is this valuable, everyone else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, cool. So do you mind if I just extrapolate on that a little bit? Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay, so, so Brendan and I went uh, with... Um, with uh, it doesn't matter who we went with. Anyway, we went to Phoenix and Vegas and to go and look at it, because uh, 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 in South Africa we were told it was a fantastic opportunity. We spent 80,000 Rand going on this trip. Um, that wasn't even to, to that we still had to pay off flights and accommodation and everything. It was a, a celebrity and, and he was recommending. When we went there, the first box that wasn't ticked was we were like, can we meet the partners? Like, who, who will do the management? No, no, we got partners. Okay, of course, can we meet them? No, 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 we got them. Okay, cool, can we meet them? In a week, we didn't meet a single person. So I'm going to be sitting in Johannesburg, whether it's my property or your property, you're still going to be phoning me going, what the fuck's going on? I'm like, shit, I don't know, I never met the guy. <laughs> okay, so, so for me, that, that didn't take the box. Then secondly, in terms of what I said, in terms of the rentability, you know, we were looking at stuff in, in Vegas, I don't know if you know, but Vegas, the, you know, the, um, it's the highest unemployment in the whole of America. Okay, there, the 65% the of the whole economy of Vegas is based on tourism, there used to be about 50 million people go through the airport in, in Vegas but in the good times. It's down, it dropped down 20 million at the, at, the, at the base. It's now recovered to about 30 million. So it's still sitting at 60% of where it was. Okay, and to put that in perspective, uh, when we were there, I, I checked the news uh, broadcast because they, they, they broadcast local news in the, in the hotel rooms. And one of the things was that MGM uh, Grand was losing $100 million a month in November last year, October last year when we were there. Um, and that's only one of the hotels. So, so you know, my, my tenants would be fluctuating and in and out and whatever, you know. And, uh, and then for me, just in terms of the fundamentals, like when I was in Phoenix, we are looking at properties that were $150,000 for 1,000 square feet when I can buy something in, 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 in uh, that was October last year, for $100,000 in Atlanta that was 2,000 square feet with double the rent. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Do, do you see? So does that answer your question? That's how we've analyzed all, all these different markets in terms of in terms of where we are. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very conscious of time. I'm not going anywhere, neither is Brendan, neither is, um, neither is, uh, is uh, Yaku. Yeah. But I just wanted to, to show you something. Now, John Chin has done a huge amount of research and a new area that we are uncovering. And when we go on the buyer's trip in, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll be going there and Brendan's coming with me. We'll go and check it out. But we, we trust John in terms of what he's doing and, and, uh, and, and really, he's, he's been researching this market for the last 12 months. You must understand that John lives in Orlando. So he scours the whole of America looking at fundamentals, the opportunities, all the great questions we've been asked at the back. Those are the things he's doing constantly in terms of who the partners, can they, is there a rental income, or do we have the fundamentals? And can anyone point to where Oklahoma is? Just about Texas. Just about Texas. Nice. Right on top, you can uh, choose if you want a dollar or a rand, basically. <laughs> But because uh, when John first got hold of me and said we, you know, he's looking at Oklahoma, I was like, hm, where? Um, some interesting things about Oklahoma: the population growth is 60 percent higher than the national average of America. It's got one of the lowest unemployment rates at 4.8 percent. The national average is about 7.6 at the moment. This is a very interesting thing in terms of affordability. So green is the more affordable properties in the middle of America. The red is the unaffordable. You can see California. Phoenix, Vegas, all around this side. New York up the top there, and a little bit down here towards Miami. But, uh, but Oklahoma is sitting right there. Interestingly enough, you've got Atlanta here, and Memphis is in here as well. Okay, then in terms of affordability, 
So that is how much people uh, uh, earn in terms, of their, in terms of how much it costs. Now, like Brendan said, everything in America is worked on, on how much is the installment. So when you drive down the road down here in, in Northcliffe, when they advertise a car, it says 250000 Am I right or wrong? In America, it will say 4000 rand a month. That's how they sell everything. So the reason that this is important is that if they're earning a high income and the affordability is really good, can we see that the fundamentals long-term allows for more growth? Yes, no? Yeah. John Chung calls it a soft ceiling. Um, he uses the affordability ratio to, um, to measure whether he's got room for the property prices to, grow, uh, to go up. And then um, from there, he, he looks at the other side for a solid floor, but he looks for a soft ceiling. This, this, um, this graph is, I think, fascinating. And it's, it was during the global financial crisis, and it was a number of properties in, in America where people were underwater. So that's where their mortgage was higher than their actual, the value of their property. And the dark blue is bad, and the, the light is, 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 you know, is oh, sorry, the light blue is, is, uh, is not bad, okay? So you can see here again, look at the, the western side. California, uh, Phoenix, Vegas, all this area here, really bad. Up, up around the, the northeastern side here, but we're looking at, at Oklahoma down here, and interesting enough, Atlanta and Memphis are around these areas as well. An article that came out by Forbes in the middle of the recession, it placed Oklahoma as the number one place to invest because of the fundamentals. It's the second biggest oil producing place in America, although North Dakota is catching it fast. It's GDP growth, there it is there. Again, the green is, uh, is nearly the best. The best is the blue, and that is North Dakota, sitting right there. The green is, uh, is there, it's Oklahoma. And then lastly, the composite cost of living. So again, the, the, how much does it cost you to actually live? You can see it's very expensive to live in California and New York, but these mid-states. So Oklahoma, Memphis, Tennessee, Atlanta, Georgia are all some of the cheaper areas, which is one of the reasons that there's demand for people wanting to live there. In terms of where, I'm sure, has anyone here been to Oklahoma as an interest? Okay, one person. <coughs> you can tell us about the cloud. You can have us there. But, uh, but interestingly enough, this is a heat map in terms of wealth, and you can see the mo most wealthy people live in the north, and then around the, the western and the northern areas, basically. Is that right or wrong? Would you agree or disagree? It was 1981. <laughs> <laughs> Still counts, you've been there. <laughs> so the areas, the areas that we're looking at are Edmonds, Piedmont, Yukon, and Mustang. And if I go back to the heat map, you can see it's all in the wealthy areas. So the best areas of time, that's what John Chin was talking about. So currently the opportunities that we have are actually in Piedmont, which is the second best schooling district in the whole of Oklahoma. Edmond is, is the best, but this is effectively the Santon, this is the Bryanston. <coughs> I live Careful, careful. Okay, so just to show you some examples, this is the houses that new construction for the gentleman who didn't like wood, they're all brick. And uh, it just gives you an idea of, uh, of the type of properties, the plans. This is a three bedroom property, so you've got, the, you've got the master, the two and the three, and then the open plan living, double garage living area. This here is a four bedroom property, and I've got a quick video just to show you <coughs> what it looks like in terms of the suburbs and neighbourhood. For those who've been to Australia, it reminds me a lot of Australia as well. <laughs> no wall, no electric fencing. <laughs> Shit, how do those people live there? <laughs> <laughs> so again, there are plans and you can see that the master bedroom, bedrooms two, three and four, living area, garage. It's very stock standard in terms of what we're used to um, here in South Africa as well. And then, um, I don't know if it's worth watching this video, John was just taking a personal video on his iPhone, uh, just in terms of the quality of finishes. Uh, but it's all, it's all new build construction. Um, in terms of what I was looking at. I, I have no idea why he closed the door at this point. <laughs> any reason to look at any um, environmental factors in any of these cities? Very important. So in uh, Oklahoma, they have uh, tornadoes, and, uh, but you have insurance for that. 
And interestingly enough, if, if it's costing you $700 a month to have insurance in Atlanta, it costs about $750 in Oklahoma. And if your house gets taken out, they, you know, you get rebuilt, you get repaid out within three weeks. That way it's worth. That's why it's brick. Yeah, these on the brick, yeah. So, who's the, what's the story of the Dorothy. That got blown away? Yeah, yeah, the Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz or whatever. But no, it is, it's important. But again, that's where we do a huge amount of due diligence to make sure that this stuff's all covered and that you're protected. Yeah. And, and one of the questions they asked was of the big insurance companies was how fast do they pay out? Because it's one thing saying, oh yeah, we, you do have insurance and we do pay out and everything, but then you sit with a vacant house that's been blown down and you wait a year for your money. So it's, they, they pay out within uh, two to three weeks. That's the average at the moment and they just had a tornado over there. I think about 10,000 people are displaced, so we've got tenant demand. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this just gives you an idea of the type of properties. Um, again, we've got, uh, we've got all the cash flows and everything. Brendan's got them available on the USB. So, so we've actually got three properties available. One of them is tenanted in Oklahoma at the moment, new build from the developer. The nice thing here is that there is 50% financing as well. Um, and, uh, and there's a management company. This management company, this is the company that managing 2,100 homes. They've got offices all over the place, you can see here. And again, I, I've got a huge amount of respect for John Chin. He understands this stuff is more important than actually finding a property in the first place. So just to run through our climate, some of the, the, the highlighted points that John, the, the, the 10 top factors that he likes is that it's got less than 5% unemployment, it's got the lowest vacancy rates, um, currently about 2%. The property manager in Oklahoma has over 300 properties under management already. The population growth is trending 60% higher than national average. It's got strong growing GDP, 60 billion uh, for the MSA, which stands for Metropolitan Statistical Area. It's very landlord friendly. A question that hasn't been asked, which is a good question to ask, is America is very specific. So in California, it's tenant friendly. So what that means is that the, the rights of the tenant are better protected than the landlord. In Atlanta, in Memphis, in, uh, in, in Orlando, and, and in Oklahoma, they're actually landlord friendly. But this one's the most landlord friendly. Like, yeah, literally, even if a guy fights you, he's out within three weeks. Thanks for playing. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Just going back to the tornado question, what happens if you, your tenanted unit gets blown over in terms of your responsibility to the tenant? You've uh, included in the insurance as a million dollars of personal liability okay. insurance as well. So it would cover them for that. What's well, keeping most of the uh, population growth? <coughs> Oil. Oil and also low cost of living, uh, quality of lifestyle in terms of sun. You know, if you're living in the snow in, in New York, and, and then oil is driving the economy, which is driving jobs. Yeah, so, so North Dakota and Oklahoma City um, both have a very similar thing where fracking is becoming... Does everybody know what fracking is? Yeah. Um, but it's becoming very prevalent in those uh, areas because... What used to happen in the, in the 1980s when they had a, b a bit of a boom um, because of the oil, they dropped one well um, and one in ten that actually hit oil. At the moment, nine in ten they hit oil because of fracking, and um, they, which means they can access a lot more. And as a result, uh, everything is going up. Um, and it's it's also close to Texas, which is close to the the Gulf Coast, which means they can um, export oil. Uh, so there's a lot of people getting drawn in for unemployment for employment. Um, at the same time, it's, I think it's the second uh, lowest unemployment ratio in the whole of the U.S. Um, the only one that beats it is North Dakota at the moment with a 3% unemployment ratio. The whole of the U.S. is something about 7.8% uh, over there. So, yeah, under 5% is actually very, very massive. They, they actually can't find enough skilled people, and that's what's drawing people in, um, which means they're paying them more, and that's why people can earn more, because there's skill shortage, so they're getting offered more money in order to come and live there. The, from a micro perspective, it's class A locations, as I said, it's, uh, that Piedmont is actually the second best area in the whole of, uh, in the whole of Oklahoma. It's 50 minutes from the CBD, major highest grade schools, awesome demographics. For those of you who've been to America, you'll know that it's very quality up, um, educated, white collar workers. Uh, and you're buying in suburbs. The builder that we deal with only sells 10% of stock to investors. So it's 90% owner occupied, which for me is very important. Micro, there's new construction, so it's got a 10-year builder's warranty. It's all brick, you can see that from the prices. Uh, sorry, from the pictures. It's got international financing at 50% loan value at 8.25%, and the net return is between 8 and 9%. So it's generally a rent ratio of about 
of the purchase price in terms of what you're looking at. So those are the those are the fundamentals for me in terms of Oklahoma. Just before we finish off, and I'm conscious of time, there's a couple of people in the room that have invested in wealth fund rates, and I just wanted to give you a quick overall in terms of what is happening with wealth fund rates, because even the guys that came with us in May, we then stayed for another 10, uh, about eight days yeah. or so. Um, so there's quite a lot changed in terms of what's happening. So just to give you a quick update on wealth fund rates, um, the, for those of you who don't know what wealth fund rates is, everything we've spoken about today is individual investing. So it's buying an individual apartment, buying an individual house. Wealth fund rates is crowdfunding. It's where we get together. It's the it's the it's the benefit of buying um, wholesale effectively. So we've got buying power. So if I've got my million dollars and and the four of us get together, we've got a lot more buying power in terms of what we do. So, just in terms of what's happening, I phoned up uh, Henny when Brendan was there with me, and Henny and Valen came over, and, and our investment committee is Brendan, myself, and Henny, I pretty much said to him, dude, it's time to go, uh, we've got the money in the bank, we've got everything set up, we, we need to get going. So Henny came over, we, we've had some challenges with the contracts, um, we got the lawyers, Grant Thornton's lawyers in South Africa to do all the contracts, they then said, is there a lawyer in the room, anyone? They didn't send the contracts to the lawyers in America, and you know what lawyers are like, they, no matter what you give them, it's all wrong. So the American lawyers redid everything, they didn't send it back to the South Carolina but told us it's all wrong. I feel like a ping pong ball, boing, boing, boing. So anyway, that's, uh, I'm trying to get that resolved with Ian Scott, who's the managing partner. Uh, which, which also involves the tax side because it's very important whether it's a dividend or, or an interest in terms of a return. But saying that, the market is moving really fast. We, we looked at a deal with RJ. For those of you who know RJ, he's the guy on the ground in Atlanta. He had an opportunity for land where there were 68 plots of land at $4,800 per plot. The, to just, now, these are service plots, okay? To, to service that plot would cost anywhere from twenty five to about forty thousand dollars in today's money. So if we're buying at four thousand eight hundred dollars, can we agree that's good value? Yeah. yeah. Now the second thing with RJ is that, that those funds that I spoke about, Blackstone, Colony Capital, whatever, he already has a relationship with them. He's been helping them find properties already. So what he's already tied up with them, like John Chin was talking about, is that we tie up the land, we build the houses and we sell them straight into the uh, the fund. Now, as a developer, anyone who's a developer, is that, does that sound good? Yeah, yeah. good. Pre-sold properties, all 68 of them had contracts already. The challenge is, to date, is that those of you who know RJ know that he likes to do a contract. Just quite happy. He, he's not, I don't know detail what the best way is yeah. to say, he's hey? Not detail oriented. He's not detail oriented. He's, he's, uh, he's very entrepreneurial. And, and it's extremely difficult to time down in terms of it. So to answer the, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity, but we, we haven't as yet pulled the trigger because there's a, always a fine balance between speed and safety. And safety is of more concern than speed. So, but, but still, it's, it's an opportunity. We are trying to work with RJ because the man is one of the best guys at uncovering the opportunity. But that's why we have Henny on the team to make sure that we're, down, we're limiting any downside risk in terms of where we're at. In terms of the flipping properties, um, even the people that were there in May will, will attest to the fact that the market with all the funds and everything coming in has moved so quickly now that there's so little inventory. And RJ already has capital. He was going to be our partner in terms of flipping properties purely in Atlanta. There's not enough margin anymore to necessarily make it worthwhile. And we don't believe, and, and it's the whole model of our program, there's no point in investing just for the sake of investing. You know, it's better to, you only invest if there's a decent property, a decent return. Make sense? Or to get out of South Africa. Right? <laughs> well, the money sitting in gold is still better. But the, there is a lot of good news, but the best news is that we managed to secure John Chin to work exclusively for us on behalf of Wealth Fund in America, um, which for me is extremely exciting. So he is scouring the market. Brendan mentioned North Dakota. He's going up to North Dakota in the next day or two to look at uh, projects up there. There's yields in North Dakota anywhere from 25 to 40%. Okay, I don't want to go to North Dakota, it's like minus 30 degrees, but, um, but it's interesting in terms of what's happening. So John Chin is, is very valuable, and he's got four opportunities for us at the moment. It's got land, so exactly like I just explained to you, there's apartment blocks, there's medical city, and then there's Oklahoma City. And just to show you some pictures, because I, I believe pictures are far better than talking. So this here, look here, this is in Atlanta, 
So we, we could buy this land. The exit price of the houses around uh, 180 to 225. It's 39 estate lots at four and a half thousand dollars each. That's 180 thousand dollars to buy it outright. Are they serviced? They're serviced. Serviced, yeah. And we're only looking at service stuff. We're not interested in big farms. Yeah. So some of the estates like this one looks fairly fairly barren. Our strategy is to focus on estates that are between 40 to 60 percent built out. They already have the tennis court. They already have the clubhouse and everything in place. Which is becoming more and more difficult to find because those prices are already starting to increase. Um, but uh, they actually call them uh, pipe farms. So if you drive around there, you'll see the odd pipe sticking out the ground, and that shows that they're they're serviced. And you can actually see a lot of them uh, uh, if they haven't cut the the lawn or anything recently. There's like little um, pine trees growing everywhere, and they're you know about four or five feet high. And they you can see they they've been there since 2007, 2008 when everybody just stopped everything when they ran out of funding. I mean, this, this, this is fairly common sense. Builders were going in, they were putting all the infrastructure... There's, there's some of the houses then, in there. And then they went bankrupt. And so... We, yep. We are the local investors. And the local property They, uh, they... It's a very good question. So the builders are, like I said in all the articles, are trying to come back. But the banks are not financed. Because the banks have been so badly burned in the same way they have in South Africa, on land, that they, they're not financing. So the average builder doesn't have financing. We've, we've done this in Australia for the last four years, where we took $4 million and, and managed to, over four years, turn it into $40 million. And we did it by financing Australian developers that needed cash. So we were the buffer. We were the, we were the buffer. And so they had the opportunity. We, we had the capital. And, and we worked in 50-50 JVs. So Does that answer your question? So yep. you're saying if we look in at the loan value of 50%, those developers don't have that? They don't, uh, they, 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 we, the 50% loan value is on a built house. They don't have it to do construction finance or to, to buy land or anything like that. Yeah, this is all cash, basically. Yeah. They also not prepared to take an 8% interest rate. On their money. Yeah, because they see that as, as expensive. Uh, as mezzanine finance, you know. Um, but still, they, couldn't, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't get it even to, to buy the land at 50%. We got notification now on those 68 lots that were over there because RJ managed to secure uh, pre-sold units with a massive client, uh, Colony and Blackstone Capital. I think it, it was put about 30%, 70% of what they were taking. And because he had those contracts in place, they were able to get building loans, um, which means they didn't need our finance uh, as a result of that. But we're actively looking for opportunities where the builders need the money, where they, they can't get access to it, um, you know, because they don't have the relationship with the, with the colonies and Blackstones and that type of thing. Just quickly, sorry, um, to interrupt, carry on. For us that are sitting here in the room now, what is the opportunity here? Are, are, you, are you proposing that those, each lot is sold individually, or are you going to buy up the whole lot? At the moment, we're looking at it from on behalf of the Wild Fund where we buy it up and we, we do it, we, you know, we work with the builder to, yeah, exactly. So we, we put in the money and you get above a certain return, you get right. the percent <coughs> of Correct. So we get no fees, there's no fees, um, it, it's a complete return up to 11% and then we share after 11%. So in other words, uh, 11% is the least that we could get, but we could get more. You could get less, you could get 10%, okay. but then I get zero. Yeah. Nothing. There's no so salary, there's no fees, there's no... Yeah. <coughs> I, can I suggest, just for the purpose of time, everyone, if people are interested, let's sit and talk afterwards. Yeah. I just want to give an update because there are people that are in the <coughs> in terms of... And this is why the breakfast is so important, because six months ago we weren't talking about that. You know, but things are changing and you've got it like John Chin said. So I'll sort of show you one more video quickly. This one's a more built out uh, type of state. This is the type of thing that I really like. So just quickly, just before I go, I forgot to show you the numbers there. So it's 33 lots at $11,000. So it's a $363,000 investment. But you can see the whole estate is, is, is uh, a lot more built out. Isn't this a more upmarket estate? This is a more upmarket estate, yeah. So you'll find some of them have homeowners associations where they put a minimum square footage of how much you need to build of, of the house which means that determines your extra price. Um, because if you've got to build a 3,000 square foot house, you're going to sell $250,000, dollars $300,000, there about. What are the building costs per square foot there? Depends on where and, and what. Uh, they're, at the moment, the builders are very, very hungry, but they're becoming more and more scarce. And the, the price of um, goods of lumber is going up. So it can be anywhere between about $55 a square foot and 80 to $85 a square foot. 
depending on the builder you're working with and how much access they have to to supplies. Yeah, the trees have grown. Yeah, the trees have grown. You see the little one. Right on the right is where the golf course is. Good. <laughs> 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 well, I'll make a question up here. Just in my interest, because it's something we did talk about. Who would be interested if it was a solution where we came and there were 30 lots and, and you could buy a lot yourself? This was your lot. And we gave you three exit strategies. One is we, we get a builder to build a house for you and then manage it. One is we build the house and sell it into a fund or something. And the third one is you don't build anything for now, you just buy a piece of land and you hold it for five years with the intention you might be able to build it. Yep. That's a show of hands, you might be interested in that. Okay, it's interesting. Um, it's just, you know, without bagging competitors, I'm not going to mention that. <laughs> but uh, some other people have sold land, and I'm, I'm not a big land component because it doesn't earn an income. Um, particularly in England where they sell farms with the sit, hope and pray strategy that you get planning. Yeah, you have that. All the services are in place, you know, in terms of what's happening. In the UK, it's called land banking, and they're trying to, the financial services authority is trying to close it down because it's basically a scam. Because well, they never get planned. I think it's called the sit open brace strategy because uh, you don't know. I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm very conscious of time, so I just want to show you some quick things. This is an apartment building. It's not in a great neighborhood in, uh, in Atlanta. It's got a purchase price of about $400,000. It's got uh, currently a vacancy of about 70%, and even with a vacancy of 70%, it's capping over 20%. Pretty interesting numbers. You know, and it's going to take some hard work, but in terms of going and, and uh, renovating and fixing it up and everything, but in terms of what we're this is the type of thing that, you know, this is a long-term hold, where we buy and hold for five years, we fix it up, we, we generate the income. Yep. That's not down to the unit. No, for the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> How much capital are you looking for to be a participant in wealth migration? The minimum share investment is fifteen thousand dollars. One share is fifteen thousand dollars. Okay. Um, this is a big this is a big opportunity. It's a commercial opportunity. This is in Orlando. Medical city is being built. It's the uh, it's going to have more economic impact on Orlando than Disney World. Mm. That's pretty big. Okay. Um, it's the biggest mega medical establishment in America. This is the Orlando Airport. You can actually see the runway just down in the, in the right hand side there, so down here. This is one of the major roads leaving the airport. This is one of the major roads going north south. This opportunity is this piece of land here on the corner. The idea behind it is that you're actually buying 30 acres that can be cut up. The one on the corner here already, literally, we, we buy it up, we pass it off. We've already got someone that would like to buy that for a garage. We've got someone that would like to buy this for a. a for self storage, the idea would be to, to do a light industrial across here and to keep this parcel of eight acres and actually do our own um, semi density, medium density uh, residential development. This is a $4 million transaction. It's been on the market for years at about $8.5 million. And to answer the question that should be asked is like, why isn't someone else buying it? Because there's not that many Americans running around $4 million. That's the bottom line. Until we look at it and then all of a sudden there's three offers on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then lastly, in terms of Oklahoma, a massive opportunity in, in Oklahoma is where, the, again, the banks are not giving finance to the builders or the developers to do what we would call sectional title townhouses. And so the idea there would be to go out and land bank two and three acre lots and then over time to, to, to go into the market and to build them and to ultimately rent them out. Once you rent them out, there is financing as high as 70 percent loan to value. And so what you do is you build them out, tenant them, and then refinance, recapitalize, and move on to the next project. And that's actually from a, from a bank, so it'll be commercial loan, which means we can get it for about between 45 and about 6.5%. And, uh, and for commercial, it'll be a, around 10 years for the loan. Yeah. So some of the challenges we, we faced in terms of what we do in terms of our own investing, and I, I like to use the word reality, the banking has been a nightmare. Anyone that's dealt with an American bank it's, it's easier to buy a gun than it is to open a bank account. Uh, it's probably easier to kill someone than it is to open a bank account. Um, it's, it's ridiculous. So we, we work hard with Wells Fargo. It's a constant ongoing battle. I know Yakus had some really good uh, success with, with SunTrust as well in terms of opening people bank accounts from here so that they don't have to go over. But, but it's been a constant challenge and I presume it will be a constant challenge for the rest of our lives knowing American banks. Um, the other problem we had was, uh, was the valuations. 
Uh, when you go on the internet, it's very disconcerting because you put in the zip codes and you find properties and, and suddenly you're buying a property for 110,000 and you look on the internet and there's values of 52 and 79 and 76 and 20 and you think to yourself, what is going on? And you really think, right, these scallops from South Africa are, are raping me. So what, uh, so what Brent and I did in May after everyone else left, we had a million dollars in the bank, we had an American bank account, we had an American cell phone, and a week before we got to Atlanta, we went on the Trulios and the websites and we put in, um, we, we got all of every single person. Most of them, about 18 of these properties that were on here, were actually from Real, Realty Track, which is a company, it's just like a marketing company of properties that are in foreclosure. They're still in the foreclosure process. They've been going for, I think the worst was about four years. Yeah, um, in terms 12 of days or something. And, you know, when you're reading all these articles, you can't think that just suddenly we're going to magically find it. We were amazed that even though we sent to agents, we have a million dollars in the bank cash, it's an American bank account, we can close fast, we've got an American cell phone number, and we'll be there in a week. And guess how many calls we got? Zero. No. You won. <laughs> Not so one. we keep going to our partners, and this happens, I, I know Tony, you asked the question I think to, to Brendan, we asked the guys, you know, you do find stuff on the ground, and our partners say, go and try and get it, you know, and, and, and our kind of attitude, you know, we, we, we got a huge amount of comfort that in terms of the, what you see on the internet, the reality is, is very different in terms of the market, and it's just important to understand that in terms of what, what is happening, and if you don't, when we arrived, trusted. Come and come with us. <laughs> yeah, when we arrived in, in Atlanta, um, John Chin was driving us around because we arrived about a day before uh, some of the other people, and we were checking some stuff out. And um, we, we told him the story, and we said, "Listen, you know, we, we did this and we did this," and he's like, "Oh, but everybody's got a million dollars at the moment. The, the agents don't even respond to that type of stuff anymore," um, which is very weird because you've got the one side where nobody's buying anything, and then you've got the other side where the hedge funds and the guys are coming in, and nobody responds to you if you've got a million dollars. And then, like, we can close fast. We want to have a look at whatever opportunities you have available, and the guys just point blank ignore you. Um, and it's not, it's not even just that. Um, to, add, to add to that, this is a real life story. There was a, a, a lady that came to the extravaganza. She bought a property, and then she went on the internet. She found something cheaper down the road. We got all the RJ, and we asked about the property. He said, I oh, know exactly that property. It's called a short sale, which means it's going through the foreclosure process. I actually personally have it under contract. So she was buying a property for, for, from him for about 110. This one was down the road for about, uh, I think 85 was the exact number. So she said, well, can I buy it with you? And he said, yes, I'll be able to bring it to you for somewhere between 100 and 140. I haven't been into the property, but I know that I normally spend between 13 and $15,000, so pretty somewhere between 100 and 140. And she flipped her lid and pulled out and everything else. That same property we found out two weeks ago, he decided not to buy it because on, in America you've got a thing called title and there was bad debt on the title, and that title, that debt stays with the company. No, with the sorry, property. stays with the property. Yeah. Okay. That property was sold on auction two weeks ago for $130,000, including the bad debt. Okay. And then whoever bought that property still has to go and organize to get it renovated, etc., and then provide a management solution and all. So there's a huge amount else included in it. Yeah. Okay. And cleaning up a title can take six months, a year. It's a, it's a fight that you really don't want to take on if you don't have to. Uh, uh, buying something with clean title means you actually own it, it's yours. Uh, if you've got title insurance over it, if anything does crop up, it means that uh, the title insurance will pay out against that debt instead of you, but it needs to be clean when you, when you buy it. Um, so it's a very important point. Just, um, this was an article, I don't know if it was, I think it was after you got there, Peter and uh, Tony and the guys were there. This was actually in the Atlanta newspaper about how difficult it is for buyers to buy property. And the tips were, if you want a house, make an offer quickly, there's a good chance it'll be off the market if you wait. Don't know if all the asking price is no longer a buyer's market, and other buyers often offer more. Um, in America, rather than being below the asking price, generally you pay anywhere up to 25% more than what you see. Uh, sorry, normally about 25% more. Make your offer clean without a lot of contingency. So I mean, that was the local newspaper telling people out of our properties. I'm just trying to explain to you the demand in terms of, in terms of where we're at. And then lastly, in terms of the process, and this is credit to, to Brendan and, and Yuck, who's been doing a huge amount of work, we've struggled also in America, because every single place is different. Every management agent is different. All the processes are different. The laws are different so we yeah. worked... State. Uh, the laws are different from state to state. Every yeah. state, basically. So we've, we've, you know, we've wanted to invest in these different areas, and we've kept getting tripped up. So we as a company have actually have, have really worked hard in terms of the process flow. And I mean, this credit builds a very detailed process flow of all the different procedures in terms of getting the setup, 
sourcing the property, closing the property, and then the after sales. And, and we were also upskilled in terms of Yaku's work with upskilling our team to make sure that things don't fall through the cracks. And we can provide the support on our side in terms of... So can I ask a question here? Does anybody see any value in having a company set up offshore that you can actually hold money in if, if you don't even buy a property? Anyone? Yeah. So, yeah, do you see the value in actually having a structure overseas that you can at least move some money over, even if you don't do anything with it, you know it's overseas um, and it's, it's there. Uh, you know, I, I see that kind of value um, massively, even if I don't buy a property with it, it just means that I can fly over there and I can use my own... Wells Fargo or Bank of America credit card or whatever the case may be, um, you know, and just start building a credit and start rating. building a credit rating, which is extremely important for me as well. But if there is value in that, then seriously, guys, come and see us afterwards. We're going to be sitting here. Let's get it, at least the company set up done and move some money overseas so that you are empowered by having that over there. And do what you want to with it, but at least that's sorted for you. Just um, to turn, sorry, Brandon, mm. it's very slightly. Oh, it's not too complicated or complex. If it's not an American company, if it's an, an island company, for example, or a Mauritian company, yeah. Are they, uh, is it more difficult or, or, or I should say it's easier to do it through a company like that than through a South African entity? Or does it have to be American? Uh, well, in terms of uh, being able to take advantage of the US market, it's best to have an American entity. Um, what you want to try and avoid as much as possible mm -hmm. legally is withholding tax. So if you've got a, an offshore trust, for example, if it's not in Mauritius, Mauritius is a, is a, um, is a key country for a particular reason. We spent a lot of money with Grant Thornton to check all of this stuff out and Mauritius popped up as, as an option if you're going to hold an offshore company there as a holding company for your LLC in the States. Uh, the, the basic thing is you still have to have an LLC in the States. That's the bottom line. Whatever you put above or below it uh, starts determining what your tax liability is going to be. If you've got a South African trust, for example, immediately there's going to be 30% withholding tax on anything that you do um, and you're liable for that. So it's... Uh, it's extremely important to make sure that you're aware of that. If you're doing it in, in Mauritius, there's a way to bring it back to South Africa with only a 5% withholding. Um, but then the administration cost of that starts becoming like, well, how big is my portfolio to offset the administration cost of that holding company in Mauritius? Because if I've got my LLC over there, I know it's going to cost me about $100 a month. I'm happy with that. If I've got to do admin on two and do bookkeeping on two and pay accountants on two, all of a sudden my portfolio has got to be bigger to warrant that extra cost. Uh, can I can I put in there? I'm conscious of time, yeah. everyone, and uh, I think you know we can talk about the structure for forever. Okay? And, and we're going to sit at this table afterwards if anyone wants to come and ask questions on the structure. The one thing I will say that I learned about America that's awesome: there's no transfer fees. So if you invest in London or Australia, get your ducks in a row before you buy the house, because if you then get uh, the wrong structure, you've got to pay stamp duty on it every time. In America, it's called the quit claim deed. It costs about $150. So like Renan said, buy a new LLC and then you can worry about the structure above whether it's Mauritius, England, Isle of Man, St. Lucia, whatever, yeah. afterwards. You know what I mean? We, we did actually, a quick claim. It's really easy. You know, in yeah. six months' time, you decide it's completely wrong. I'm going to change it. It costs you $150. Change it. You know what I mean? So, so I would say that the base is, is the LLC. Get that sorted and you can always adjust and move around from that LLC afterwards. Just quickly, I just wanted to show you, we, we, we started going over, Brent and I, and, uh, and, and realized that you know, a lot of people said to us, you know, what is, uh, you know, can, can you buy me a property or whatever? Let's borrow that quickly. And um, so what we did is in October is we said, well, look, we're going over, why don't you join us? And uh, Dustin and a couple of guys, you know, came with us. There's actually a little brochure in here. Our next trip is...